Um, uh, greetings, oldsters, younglings, and Weisenheimers. I hope you're ready to spout the gab with us today. I am Harrison H. Smith, and with me is Nicky Flamingues. Uh, hello. <laughs> and of course, we've got uh, Daddy Hassafras here too. Mm, good day. This is a podcast all about tabletop RPGs, and within this feculent audio box, you will find a trove of esoteric segments such as feedback. We've got news punch. We've got what you've been slaying. We've got the main subject, which is going to be the best post apocalyptic setting ever made. <laughs> and then we're going to do your electro letters. And. The, tr- the trouble is, I'm quite tired today, listeners, so if this is low energy, you know, just kick back, <laughs> smoke a doobie. Get a cup of tea. And just relax, because this, this is not going to be the usual high on potato. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> That's right. But yeah, before we get on with the show and go on to feedback, I just wanted to um, just tell you about a dream I had last night. I know that's quite boring to talk about dreams. <laughs> But I dreamed last night that J.K. Rowling was doing an AMA on Reddit, <laughs> yeah. um, answering her like top questions she's ever been answered, and one of them was, "When's the next Mork Borg actual play coming out?" <laughs> Is that what she asked? Yeah. <laughs> so what the hell does that mean about me? <laughs> that means she's got a good you... question. <laughs> that means that Harry Potter <laughs> is, in, is on your case, <laughs> or J.K. He's going to be. Um, He's going to be in the next uh, Borg episode. <laughs> oh, Harry Potter. Gary Rotter. Gary Rotter. <laughs> Gary Rotter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're a zombie, Harry. <laughs> I'm a what? <laughs> <laughs> You're a zombie, you weep. Oh, that's deep. Anyway, uh, let's do some feedback, shall we? Mm-hmm. Yes. The feedback side. The feedback side. Yes, bitch. The feedback side. It's the feedback section. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, last episode, right, we uh, obviously, for some reason, during the section about news, Nick decided to tell us that his brother-in-law has just got the D&D beginner box, <laughs> um, and that was the biggest news of the week, because we got a lot of feedback about that. Phileas Foss, he says, I'm well chuffed for Anthony. <laughs> Woo. Ace B, he says, just listening to this show now, you should get Anthony on the show. RPG, the flower him on air. Oh, lovely. And of course... To commemorate this event, I did make a meme of it, but Nick was like, yeah, let's make a meme out of him. Then I did, and then Nick was like, no, I don't think he'd want to be memed, because I put a picture of him <laughs> on our... I think you meant literally. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I meant literally. Uh, it was just a picture of Anthony holding that D&D box set, and it just said, when you realise that you're Anthony. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> oh, bless him. <laughs> yeah, people love an Anthony, but probably the guy with the best name in the world is Reginald Tickle. Oh yes, and uh, he com- <laughs> he comes in. Um, he says, "I think modern role playing has created this idea that the GM is writing a story and not the players, which I think is wrong and leads to GMs cheating to get the result they want, which is railroading." Mm. Trust is the single most important thing in RPGs. When the players and DM trust each other, rulings come and go easy, and players don't feel frustrated. I think he makes a good point. Um, Does make a good point. You talked. Uh, you said last time, Nick, about the fact that if the GM's sort of fudging and then suddenly not fudging, the players are going to notice. Yes. And I think that is where he's coming from here because if you, if you do that, how are you going to trust the GM isn't going to cheat in just about every situation he wants? Well, that's it. Yeah, and you never know whether you're getting away with like you know as a player if you get into a point like that you don't know whether you're like being a really good role player and doing really good teamwork with your party or whether you're just be you know you're just getting you know it's just basically getting looked after by the gm so yeah yeah and definitely you know that's why i'm enjoying at the moment uh, with savage worlds because with games like D, as much as i like them it's like you can't really ever fully trust it because the gm keeps the target number secret Yes. And more often than not, right? Mm-hmm. And in Savage Worlds, you know what it is, and yeah, yeah. you just have to try and beat it. And as a result, it's like, well, there's no way for, for me to cheat. So that yeah. trust is sort of that's a, implicitly there. That's a, yeah. Yeah. That's very true. Well, we, I mean, there's, there's trust anyway in our group. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what you think. If you're managing to put a there, plot in the background. There's a gun seller taped under James's gaming table, oh. just in case. I knew it. Just Fucking knew case. it. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. All right, well, that is it for feedback. Let's go into the news. 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 Oh, yeah, news punch. 
Steve Jackson plays D and D with Ben Elton. <laughs> and those those are words I never thought I would say. <laughs> no, but what? Th- this isn't this isn't exactly news. This is more of the uh, with the olds. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, a segment of a TV show from 1984 has just surfaced, coming onto YouTube. Somebody ripped it from a VHS. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, basically this program's purpose was to shine a light on the crazy new fangled game of Dungeons and Dragons. And the show's filmed inside a games workshop store and presented by Ben Elton of Blackadder fame. And the reason it's inside games workshop is because back then um, they distributed D and D in the UK. But what's interesting is that Ben Elton interviews Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston about D&D, asking them to explain what it is, and then he plays a game with them. Brilliant. And it is the most awkward, annoying game I have ever watched. Just give this a listen. <laughs> okay, so it's up to you to tell me what you're doing. There's a door at the end. Yeah, so we've got to decide what we want to do. You see, we're playing yeah. roles. We've got yeah. to decide. You've got to imagine yourself in the, the so shoes of the our characters. and things. Well, if you want, you can go to the door, because yeah. it looks pretty boring up this corridor. Yeah. So I'm going to be an old female dwarf, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. We'll be so, right behind well, you. Well, yeah. we'll be so back in here. No, so I'm going to be an old female dwarf. It's so annoying because every time Ben Elton starts the role play, they're just talking over him. <laughs> and they're like, don't worry, don't worry, we'll have your back. And it's like, he's trying to say what he wants to do. Just shut up. Shut up. Shut up. You they're so desperate to. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it, it really doesn't. It, and, and the GM, right? Whoever the fuck he is, he's not. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know who it is. But as he starts GMing, and there's like a point where Ben Elton's like, "Well, I thought you said I could detect traps." And the GM's like, "Well, I mean, <laughs> it's an ability you need to use." And he's like really cocky about it. Like you should already know what's going <laughs> yeah. on, despite never having heard of this type of game before. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking idiot! That's so yeah. stupid. What I did find funny is, I, I really like Ben Elton, obviously. Yeah, He's done some good shit. But the funny thing is, is it, how much he fits in at that table in terms of looks. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's never occurred to me before, but he looks like one of them, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he's, he's just such an awkward, like, nerd with glasses on. But anyway, it's not really news because it came out in 1984. <laughs> but I think it's a clip really worth watching because... It's quite funny, and it's kind of cool to see the perspective back then. I mean, one of my favourite parts is that um, Ben Elton's picking up different RPGs from the shelf, and he's like, for example, you could play RuneQuest, where you uh, do del- delve into dungeons in, in the realm called Glory Anther. Or you could play Dungeons and Dragons, where you pretty much do exactly the same thing. And, and, and I just found that kind of funny. because He must it was be like, pretty young then. If it's 84, Ben Elton must be pretty young then. Yeah, he's, uh, I think he looks about mid twenties, something like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, yeah. I looked him up. But that is it for news. Face, he's sixty odd at the minute. So is he really? Yeah. Bloody yeah. Yeah, he's he's well, he just writes books now, doesn't he? And some of them are actually quite good. I think they people are. have quite quite snobby about them, but I like them. No, he's good. He wrote some good TV shows as well. You know, the only other bit of news this week, and I found it. I, it's not really worth doing it. I thought it'd be funny if we did a whole episode on it, but um, <laughs> it's uh, that there was a new type of D10 discovered. Oh yeah, yeah <laughs> tell me about so, this. Yeah, tell us. Um, yeah, so Please. you know, we we spoke about in our dice episode before. It was the mm. um, that Japanese sort of mathematical institute that um, basically made the first D twenty. It was numbered one to ten. Well, they made a D ten, and it was a t- it was a different shape to the oh, others. Okay. All, right, All right, should we get on with what we've been playing? <laughs> oh, <fuck laughs> what shape is it though? Uh, well, Bone. it's just a ten sided shape. I don't know. It's like <laughs> it's very difficult to describe. To tell you the truth, James, <laughs> <laughs> that's the trouble. That's why. That's why this is this is pretty crap news altogether. Anyway. I can't okay. describe what this new D ten looks like, but it doesn't look but like. But believe D10. me, it's f- it's fucking great. <laughs> Okay. One of the best D10s I've ever seen. Can I just Google <laughs> new D10 see what comes up? It didn't, uh, it didn't yeah, work. probably. I've done it. It didn't work. <laughs> I, just, I, just got, I just got bulldozers. <laughs> I just got pictures of bulldozers. Yeah, I told you it was a weird shape. <laughs> just, just fucking roll a massive bulldozer. Oh, <laughs> lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's one of these. Oi, yeah? Stick it up your fucking dick hole! My fucking what? Hagrid, you're pushing me over the fucking line! Yes. Awesome, what we've been saying. So, yeah, um, we've been carrying on with our uh, Tough Guys weekly campaign, British Gangster setting. Um, I think at this at this point, uh, everything's gotten way, way, way too heavy for the guys. So they've gone on holiday to outrun <laughs> some uh, some heat, and they're waiting for it to die down. 
And it, the, the, basically, the main reason is is this, right? So, Albanians had come into town and had started waving their dick around. So the about Albanian mafia, just not just regular guys, but. And uh, <laughs> they've been trying to assert their dominance over the London criminal underworld, right? And um, it all came to a head when one of the one of the characters in the party, this guy called Mo Exotic, he's a um, a football hooligan, and his favourite team is Millwall. And the team are watching a TV in the pub one day, and they see the leader of the Albanians, this guy called Fanny. Um, they see him like Don't on off. sports TV, and he's like. He's kind of like, well, I've just bought this team, Millwall, and uh, I'm hoping to do good things with it. And at that point, Mo Exotic, he's just enraged. He's like, I'm going to fucking kill him. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we ended up doing our first mass battle. A bunch of football hooligans and Millwall supporters versus... Uh, so, 60 of them versus yep. 100 Albanians. And, of course, you had all the generals, which was the uh, with the player characters. And uh, yeah, when uh, when easily nobody died, everything's fine, right, guys? Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> mass battle. You know, they're not brutal yeah, easy, at all. Easy, easy peasy. Easy you know. peasy lemon squeezy. Oh my God, mass battles. Fuck me. Yeah, mass battles in Savage Worlds are kind of crazy. So how it works is that each round of fighting takes two hours, and even if you do well, it's likely that you're going to come out somewhat injured, right? Yes. So you have all the guys making their help rolls, which at the end get added to the general's battle role so in this case it was nick so he's kind of commanding all the troops most of the battle he was up a pole commanding them <laughs> telling them what to do um, yeah but yeah so so everyone's helping and then you know if you succeed you can still take damage if you uh, get a raise which is basically this game's equivalent of a uh, um of a crit then you won't take damage but crit fails and things like this mean you get a shitload of damage mm. basically yeah, and it was such a hard fight. I think it went on for about five rounds. So that'd be ten yeah. hours of solid yep. fighting. Yeah, it was um, savage. It, it was, was intense. Precisely it was, it was freaking name. awesome. And I forget how much fun and how terrifying the mass battle rules are. <laughs> yeah, because we haven't really um, we've we haven't done them um, as as much as you know just regular battles and that. We we did mm. forget how brutal they were. Oh, mate. Well, there's lots of little modifiers. So, like, um, basically, after every round that a side has lost troops, they they need to check for a morale to see if they yes, they sir. will do an orderly retreat or get captured or whatever. And those can be modified by if you set up a plan beforehand, if you're in a fortified structure. And I did mention several times that you had your sandwich van nearby for that very reason. Yeah. But getting 60 fucking hooligans in there would have been a bit of a tr trifle, I think. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was kind of crazy. So we had the yeah the leader of the Albanian was going mental with a flamethrower while his right-hand man was snapping people's heads off. We had the football hooligan throwing water coolers and chairs. We had James's character going around stealing people's wallets to um, create dissent among the Albanian troops <laughs> yeah. and we had another guy going ham with two desert eagles and <laughs> he was he was shooting the light fixtures off of the yep. stadium as the fight was like pouring out into the seats in the Millwall stadium it was pretty fucking crazy but James's character one of his best characters ever Sidney mm. McQuembe he is now he died no in more. the fight yeah. Yeah. so yeah. terrible he got pummeled to a pulp sad. He was absolutely destroyed. It's oh. because it's because um, Sydney uh, got incapacitated, then had to roll his death roll, um, or yeah, whatever you call it, and incapacitation roll. That's it. And he, um, yeah, he just he rolled a crit fail and died. Mm. And it was funny because uh, at some point we, he just went quiet, and we all thought on the Discord thingy that he was quiet because he'd done so well and everyone yeah. was like, oh, <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> he's made You'd it. Wait yeah. for it, eighty-seven. I or logged something. out, didn't I? <laughs> He just heard that. Oh, yeah, that's it. He, yeah. And then everyone, everyone started, yeah. started laughing. And then I came back <laughs> yeah. on. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of people aren't going to... Well, they probably you may know from previous episodes the kind of storied history of Sydney that he's been trying to get with this girl for in the game for um, 15, 16 sessions now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it ended up with her running off to marry somebody else. But I sort of saw as Sydney died... Um, it was around the same time that the wedding with someone else was happening and uh, yeah so yeah, story wise Sydney died and just after he died the girl Tiffany came back 
having regretted her choice and wanted yeah. to actually get with Sydney, only to find he was dead. Uh, picked up his AK and started firing on the Albanians. So she yes. is now part of the team. She's <laughs> oh, the yeah. femme fatale of the group. Yeah. Yep. Um, Tiffany Butcher Baker from EastEnders, <laughs> <laughs> who James and I think is quite fit. But if my wife is listening, that's a joke. <laughs> Well, if you, I was trying to look up photos of her because he uses a as a character uh, avatar, and then Harrison mentioned that she was, and then I was like, "Oh God, yeah, she actually is." And the funny thing is about that though, when you were looking up pictures, was that um, I described because she's quite—I don't know if it's offensive to say Chav, but she is, and I fancy her. So, that, if anything, I'm not racist. So, she um, <laughs> she was wearing in EastEnders a wedding dress and trainers, and I and I said. Um, that she was wearing a wedding dress and, and uh, Dr. Martin boots, no, yeah. Timberland boots. And yeah. it was so funny how appropriate the fucking picture was. And I photoshopped a gun into it, of course. Yeah, that was on our group. What made me um, laugh was when, um, obviously, that's... So we've been using Discord to play, and obviously James has ch- changed his like profile picture to a picture of her. Um, mm. And I forget that that picture stays for, like, all Discord servers. So on Savage <laughs> on Savage Net, <laughs> there was, like, an organiser announcement. I'm like, who the fuck's that? And then I was like, oh, right, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, really I've funny. Listened, I changed my face because of that. I, I'm sure you, you saw. I changed my avatar. <laughs> Made me laugh. Oh, I'm so it's pretty funny. That popped up I didn't yesterday. realise that either. Um, so, oh, you tell you have, yeah. One photo for all. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, anyway, after that, um, essentially, long story short, is that they've, they've caused so much trouble uh, in London over the last few sessions that they decided it was time for a holiday. So they took their stolen Kenyan Airlines jet and flew yep. to uh, flew to Amsterdam for a, for a holiday. And because they, you know, flew privately, they've got all their all their weaponry <laughs> with them. And um, we just did a dramatic task. Oh, and don't, for... and don't, for, don't forget the animal. Oh God, yeah, yeah, we can't forget that. I just said it to the party. I'm like, if there's anything anyone else wants to do before we go to prepare for the Amsterdam trip then go ahead so everyone was doing you know different stuff one guy went to buy a gun etc etc um, but yeah Mo Exotic the reason he's got that name despite being a football hooligan is because he took the Beastmaster Edge to have a pet right yeah and it's quite funny because we kind of got a bit of a system going. The last, his first pet was a wolf, and the wolf died. <laughs> his second pet was a koala because he was robbing from the zoo in the dark. So I just <laughs> rolled randomly for. Um, and funny enough, then he was like, "Oh no, I can't go back to London Zoo. It's too hot." So he went outside of London on the bus to Chessington Zoo. That's it. Um, <laughs> climbed over the fence and uh, I was like it's really dark in there and he tried to use his phone right and phones in the 90s did not have a lot of light so I said alright <laughs> no. give, me, give me a notice roll let's see if you can pick out an animal and he's like I don't know and he suddenly he's, he's wormed his way into this cage not knowing quite what's in there and wrapped his chain around something's neck and as soon as he gets out into the car park where all the street lamps are it's a hippo so oh, he's yeah. got a, he's currently got a pet hippo which is the most powerful animal he's had yet but hasn't managed to do anything of any use. So, I mean, well, apart it's from a, bit of a fantastic shame. name, Tony Casarino. Cas- <laughs> yeah, so all of them are named after Millwall players. So the um, the koala was called Tim Cahill, and this one's called <laughs> Tony Casarino. <laughs> Tony the hippo. He did do one good thing, but we get onto that once we get to the boat bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Fucking, and um, so it was pretty funny because, yeah, on the way home on the bus, he's sitting there with a hippo, like a smelly old wet hippo sitting next to him. And it's, it's like middle of the night, and there's some old old guy from London, and he looks over at him, and uh, Mo Exotic rolls intimidation goes, You ain't never seen a fucking hippo before? Fuck off. <laughs> it's like for it's the rest of the bus, every, <laughs> bus trip, everyone's taking a wide berth from him. <laughs> So but yeah, good. so um, long story short, they escaped Amsterdam with the hippo, all their guns, and had a fucking great time. And um, they also in uh, uh, what did they do? Uh, uh, encouraged violently the Albanians to join their gang. So they've got like forty gang members now. So we're using the henchman rule from Saga of the Goblin Lord. Oh yes, which is fun as shit. But yeah, so in Amsterdam, we did a sort of dramatic task for them to have a great fucking night out. <laughs> Success means you had a good fucking time, and failure meant you were spending the rest of your the next day fucking sick as a dog, right? And but they the only they didn't just go to Amsterdam just to get high. They also went there to go and find a shipment of prostitutes to bring home. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point, they <laughs> realised that they didn't have any accommodation. So what happens is is that Mo Exotic jumps in the river. His himo, his himo, his hippo, <laughs> himo, swimming. him and his himo, yeah. 
him and his himo, they're swimming and he's on the back of it and he's just sidling up against this barge where a recently married couple are having a nice moment and suddenly, you know, all of them just sort of jump on board at the same time, push them <laughs> off and the, the captain is like the most typical captain character that there possibly could be and he's like, you push me customers into the water and um, yeah, then they just give him 100 quid and he's like, what customers? And so yep. they've got a barge for the... Uh, for the rest of the trip and oh, yes. they've met this kind of madam and I'll, I'll wrap this up pretty quickly now but essentially they met this madam uh, who was a madam at a brothel they met her boss who was a pimp and he turned out to be an absolute scumbag and was coming on to James's new character Tiffany um, but the thing is is that he had this sort of underground uh, animal fighting ring as well so uh, they fought him as he let out a bear and alligator and an alligator so that was that was the fight and they they did pretty well actually but the hippo um fucked it and got his head stuck in the reception desk so um <laughs> <laughs> but now they because that guy was an arsehole and they've saved them and promised the women better conditions they've got about 30 to 40 prostitutes that they're gonna uh, put in their brothel back in the uk so that's pretty fucking good that's a yeah. success that's a, that's success. a success. I've ever seen one. that's a criminal success i tried to make that pimp as disgusting as i possibly oh, could you, did a so good job you, there, you really hate him yeah because <laughs> basically he was he was asking to see all of the team right up in his office but just when tiffany's about to go and he puts his hand sort of across the stairway and he's he's like his hot breath in her face and he's like you can make a lot of money in my business goyle yeah. how much for the goyle she, obviously, yeah. she reacted really well to that. <laughs> well, she stormed out, but Mo well. Exotic yeah. came to your rescue. The football yeah. hooligan, like, fucking uh-huh. headbutted him. It all yeah. kicked off, mate. It was really good. It was really good. And it's, sometimes, you know what? It's just fun to kill a, a villain that really deserves it. Do you know what yes. I mean? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It was, yeah, well deserved. So it was uh, no more Golden Axe. Yes, that was his nickname because he used medieval weaponry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Don't know why. But Nick, so so, how are you enjoying where the business has got to at this point? Do you feel like it's starting to take shape? Oh, mate, brilliant! Yeah, we've got some. We've got we've got different different kind of endeavours now, haven't we? We've got like a a, a, a drug dealing business uh, under the counter of the fish and chip shop. We kind of looked at Moody Clothing, but that never really got off the ground properly. Well, you guys, is it you guys own or uh, like some, some product that belongs to yeah. J- J- Jimmy the Shoe and some market stores? But you haven't That's really it. done anything with it. Yet, no. but you still. You, but it's there in case you need it, I suppose. We, we got. The, we got, had the limos. Yeah, the limos, and you had the brothel done up, and now I've got. Got all those women. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I think we're, we're we're enterprising. It's good. It's yeah, good. I, it is. I'm liking where we're getting to. Um, I'm I'm kind of like at this point, I'm playing it probably the most dickish way I possibly can. But <laughs> it adds a bit of a bit of tension because what I usually do is if somebody starts with a new character, I'll start them like a, a couple of levels back, right? But in this, uh, I'm just having it so everyone starts from scratch. Because so we've got characters of all sort of different ability levels at this moment but James's new character is just yeah, straight, straight novice. novice but no it creates a really good dynamic and it also allows um, you know the the seasoned of the crew to actually you know they are better equipped in stats and stuff so they are going to naturally look after the novices makes sense doesn't and it it's yeah. just, totally uh, totally yeah, it's, and I feel like they've welcomed Tiffany with open arms you know and they really have defended her but you've also been a lot better because his James's last character famously used a gun and used it often but couldn't hit anything <laughs> yeah. and uh, I think the, the very last level up he took was to buy D4 and shooting but in this <laughs> character was with um, Tiffany he's, he's gone up to a D8 yeah. She's good already. She's, yeah, she's, she's a natural a, talent. She, yeah, dark horse in that regard. Yeah, yeah. She plays a lot of time crisis. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's 1995. Yeah, so that's tough, guys. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, yeah, Savage Net, the online version of Savage Con, is coming up soon. We have slightly less games than we usually would. And I spoke to one of our listeners last night, a- Ace B, and he he said that an event that he's doing, which I'll plug at the end of the show. Is having a similar sort of. It's not an issue really, but it's just he said you know people are just fed up of online gaming. So I do get it, oh, but we've got yeah. about um, six or seven games going on on twenty uh, ninth of this month, mm-hmm. and that some of them look fucking well. All of them look fucking great. We've got uh, Savage Golden Axe is happening. Oh, yeah. We've got some Deadlands run by Owen Lean. Nick, you're doing Whacked in the Wicket. Yeah. Um, Secret Files of Section D. Yeah, Secret Files of Section D, which is a up and coming Savage World setting that is really fucking good because awesome. we played yep. in one of the playtests of it. Yeah, 
It's fantastic. Um, so yeah, great fucking games we got going on here. Uh, Dan Owen's running one as well, who is a skull on a stick. So that's get, nice. yeah, if you can get into Dan's game, do because he's he's, he's he's a cracker. Um, just one last thing I wanted to plug real quick was uh, in the what we've been saying is that obviously um, I've been carrying on with my Resident Evil streams. Yes. Last night one, um, I, the only reason I wanted to bring it up is because with the uh, with the Resident Evil 1 stream, right, I've gotten to the point where, and I don't know if you've ever got this far in Resident Evil, but the the mansion suddenly gets populated by trolls. What? Like these big green troll men. And I they are fucking that. annoying. What? If if you're on caution, any level of caution, they can one-shot you. Oof, I died what? like five times. I haven't died oh. barely at all. And then what was funny is I was stuck on this puzzle where you have to push... There's these walls that crush you and you have to push this statue to a certain point, right? Yep. I was stuck on it for ages. And then suddenly somebody came into the chat called Raccoon City Police Department. Oh. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, um, I was like, uh-oh. The, Very good. The Raccoon City Police Very Department good. is here. And they're... Um, they're annoyed because I'm doing bad at this puzzle. And the guy was like, he, the guy, it wasn't even somebody, one of our fans. He was like, what? Um, I'm sorry, my English is no good. I, um, I, I uh, wait on YouTube to find people playing Resident Evil and help <laughs> oh, them beat him. all games. Oh, bless and then, him. So he helped me or finish her. the puzzle um, and with broken English as well. But it That's was uh, it was really funny. And then as soon as he'd helped me do the puzzle, he was like, okay, I must go. Goodbye. But I asked him how, I was like, all right, how's things in Raccoon City? And he was like, infested. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> it, was, it was so weird, man. But yeah, really, it was a really, really, really That's disheartening brilliant. stream. And I've got to, I got to the point where I think I was getting arrogant, to tell you the oh, truth. I thought I was oh, good man. at the game. Oh, yeah. And then I'm, I, I thought, do I do another safety save? No, fuck it. I just go to the other pl- other side of the bench and without saving. And then got one shot oh, by troll. You eat it. I know. I, reckon so I lost the, about half an hour of progress. So I'm going to redo that before I start streaming the next one. I reckon the Raccoon Fair City um, police um, user is Owen. Oh, yeah. He probably is, yeah. He's known for doing this type of thing. Fucking. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. All right. Well, let's... Uh, thanks, Owen. Let's <laughs> leave that there, and we will do the main subject, and we've got a fucking doozy for you this time, oh, ladies yes. and gentlemen. Oh, yeah, yeah. bro. Yeah, yeah. bro. Main. Subject. Ma- ma- magic. Main. Subject. Tokyo. Main. Subject. Subject. <laughs> As we all know, right, Danny DeVito's acting career is mostly over nowadays, right? But I don't know what you're thinking, so what's he doing now, right? Well, I'll tell you, because not only have I met him, but we're actually close personal friends. (laughs) You see, after DeVito's exit from Hollywood, he changed his name to Andy Hopp, moved to Ohio, and uh, started making RPGs. It's it's something that not a lot of people know, right? Um... (laughs) So yeah, uh, but, but, but why the fuck am I bringing up Andy Hop? Well, it's because today we are going to be talking about what I consider to be the best post-apocalyptic game on the market right now. Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for a bit of low life for Savage Worlds, yes. dragged from the muck by Andy Hop. Now, before we begin, I should mention that I do know Andy, and we do speak from time to time. I will, however, be completely honest with my review, and I'm not biased at all, although Andy did very kindly make me guest of honour at his convention one, one year, and give James and I an award, so, yeah. you know, Didn't get which basically is going to get a 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not, yeah. I'm not biased. Um, but as I said, yeah, it, it, I, I just I should probably say right that comparing Andy Hop to Danny DeVito, they do look very similar. They, they but I know he won't twins. be offended by that. No, no, he's, yeah, he they, gets it all the time. Yeah, and he, he actually he said it. We watched the opening ceremony of uh, Corn and the Cob once one year, and he's just like, now I know what you're thinking. What the fuck is Danny DeVito doing up on this stage? Um, <laughs> Brilliant. But yeah, so as I said, Low Life is a post-apocalyptic setting. It is actually written by one of the in-universe characters, a gadabout croach called Tukendor Flamingues. So it's presented as a kind of like travel guide of the weird world this place takes in, which means that this book is actually an in-game item also. So any players who own it are, f- are freely allowed to refer to it at the table if they want to. Look up monster stats, look up a place to see what it's like. You're more than welcome to do that. Nice. Which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool. But what the fuck is a croach? And what's a gad about? And uh, to to get to that, we'll get to that. But for now, I'm just going to read a bit of the first passage of the book. Of the book. 
All right, of the book, yeah, <coughs> yeah, because book. it's. Uh, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read a book of a passage of a book. So um, <coughs> here we go. A peep meandering through Flume's place of pondering would be fortunate to encounter a certain fossil of Flume. This croach has goggled the gaze and crusty stench of one best avoided, a dreg of society. He's not that, though. In fact, he carries in his feculent noggin a trove of esoteric wisdoms, random tidbits, and paraphernalia of the bygone. He's one of Flume's most respected oldsters, and a peep who could do worse than he'd fuzzled spoutings. This guy knows about back in the day. He waxes eloquently about the time of the flush, and so on and so on. You get the point. But this, so it's like the, the book is written in this weird kind of way, right? Love it. And I, I promise you, I'm mm. going to elucidate some of this. We'll try to understand what's going on. But the book is basically like full of all these really bizarre malapropisms and, and mangulations of words with, with like strange jumble of dialects. And it, it's really amusing and strangely familiar but unflinch unflinchingly silly mm. but i've got to be honest i've mentioned this before but um, at first it makes it really really hard to read but as you get the language and you know know what certain things mean you kind of um you you, you get it and you, yeah. it doesn't because like the language in it isn't just random it's like there's a lot of sense to the nonsense it's like there's structure and common words that get used often like peep for person or gab for talking yeah. or rumors or waggling the zazz for casting a spell it's like the book but, um, of dave and it's got its own dialect and you just got to kind of understand it after a while exactly yeah yeah um it, and, and you know like i do really really like the way it's written it's got this commitment to a certain level of uh, like type of dialogue that it never ever stops and and it's like imagine writing an entire book like that it must be exhausting oh, he's a, yeah andy hobbs a fucking genius though with um that is how true. he's done it's not, it's not hard for him like how he's translated things to to fit and all it that. is it is very very cool and it's sort of like i guess it's because it's so many years after our world it's kind of like that's why all the jumbled dialects happen and people are using all sorts of different language yep, exactly but yeah as i mentioned it's set in the future right and in the book's uh, what it actually says is it's set in a gazillion years in the future um, and that's actually what it says in the book and basically every type of apocalypse has flushed the earth clean hence the big flush in the intro there giving way to new mutated bizarre life forms like sentient twinkies or spindly insect people called croaches so the bloke that wrote the book in universe Tukendor Flamingues he's, he's a croach yeah and these are insect people and this basically this big apocalyptic event called the flush um, that's what it became known as. N that's what it became known as in in universe. Now, many of the game's factions actually disagree on how the world ended, but there is evidence littered throughout the setting that it was likely nuclear war. One example of this is Glowio, which is an irradiated desert where everything glows, and of course, the Oith's butthole on Keister <laughs> Island, where a huge. <laughs> basically this is where a huge crater is believed to be the world's bumhole essentially <laughs> but it was likely the site of a nuclear attack a gazillion years ago in any case the human race known as the human racians are gone and what's replaced them are living twinkies sentient piles of trash and smelfs now mm -hmm. what makes this interesting though is that Tukendor Flamingues the book's in-universe author refers to Oith as a festering paradise and that's because the creatures you play are built to actually withstand the irradiated planet and as such have a pretty comfortable life. I mean, this isn't a game specifically about survival, at least no more than any other RPG, because Oith has basically re rebuilt itself. And by the way, I say Oith because it's it, that's how it's pronounced in the book. Yeah. Instead of Earth, it's Oith. Yeah, Oith. Yeah, so it's basically, it's, Oith has rebuilt itself, and there are human racian ruins and stuff that get plundered by gadabouts and treasure, hu treasure hunters. But huge cities exist, theatres, clubs, bars, museums. So it's not post-apocalyptic, it's post-post-apocalyptic. No, no. post, post, yeah, exactly. Post-post-Malone. <laughs> Fuck. but yeah it's not necessarily about scarcity it's more about interesting funny and, and gross setting where you play weird shit join weird factions do weird quests and to give an example one of the adventures in the book is about the player characters playing gangsters who work for a huge worm riding twinkie with no arms and he wants you to break into a museum and steal the main exhibit a pair of arms made from cheese yes <laughs> yes please 
So, yeah, and at the end of the adventure, if you do get them, he just puts them on his body and they just work normally like normal arms for some reason. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that that's pretty cool. I mean, in a nutshell, that's basically the setting. We're going to get into character options next, but before that, there's a pretty cool part of the book I, I want to bring up. And this, I, I don't know if it'll be boring, but I, I absolutely love this. So, there's a bunch of helpful things and little tidbits like what days of the week are now called, what <laughs> national holidays exist on Oith. And also a bit of about the measurement system they use. And it's mm. funny because this part has a whole like bonkers fucking story about how they come up with the measurement system. Yep. And essentially what it was is that a bunch of the world's smartest Weisenheimers got together and couldn't agree on a measurement system and spent bloody ages arguing. And then finally, they decided that they have an eating contest, which is called grub gobbling, um, to decide who gets to pick the measurement system. And in this world, by the way, competitive eating is the number one sport. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the food that was to be eaten at the event was called circuspi nuts. And these things taste like sewage. And one nut will fill you up as if you'd had three square meals. Oh, wow. So anyway, by the end of the competition, the arena and all the contestants are covered in sick. Yeah. And, <laughs> but, and, and as the book puts it, a winner did emerge, literally, like from the vomit. Uh, yeah. And he, he ate 679 nuts. Wow. And uh, this, yeah, and this guy's yep. name uh, was, was, was Yort, right? Mm. And as such, the sole unit of measurement on Oith is a Yort. Distance, time, weight, volume, everything is measured in Yort. <laughs> yeah. So you get this, you get this backstory... And basically, it's just to say um, this game doesn't really use any traditional me measurement system, and it's all abstract for for gameplay reasons because it means that you don't have to worry about this stuff. If I tell you a high number when you ask how long this is going to take, you know, okay, that's a lot of yorts. That's a lot of yorts. That's there, fucking. Yeah. But that's so genius. It is. It oh, is yeah. incredibly genius. So it means that yeah, it just abstracts everything, uh, the boring parts out of it. It also stops um, also, meta gamers as well. Uh, well, yeah, exactly, <laughs> and. Um, yeah, it, it, it stops. Yeah, so it stops minutia, I think. But yeah, you've got this. It's kind of funny because, it, let's say for example, in our world, right? If I'm measuring something by centimeters, and I go that's three centimeters, then some. Uh, and in this world, uh, and if I measure something by inches, that would be a completely different measurement. But in this world, both are the same thing. Yeah. So you know what a map where it will say one centimeter equals one mile. On the map in this book, it just says one yacht equals one yacht. Yes, love it, <laughs> lovely, <laughs> love it. <laughs> Which I just think is so it's so funny and so great, and it's like, yeah, it's just you'll get used to uh, how many yachts a GM thinks is a lot, and you'll sort of yeah. uh, I don't know, like it's about pretty 30 cool. Yacht in it, mate. Yeah, it's about thirty yachts, and and the good thing is, is there's no north, south, east, or west as well. Those aren't yachts too. That would be funny, but it's not. Oh. Um, there's a new directional system, right? So uh, north and south don't exist, but sort of up. But you either travelling towards the Earth's butthole, which is called Holewood. That's mm -hmm. one one direction, Holewood, or you're travelling away, which is Hole Wentz. <laughs> and then Very good. To describe what, um, a, a lateral movement, what you do is you just say across from and then give a landmark. So if I told you Chloe Ho was uh, whole Wentz and across from Flume, that's 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 the directions kind right, of thing. Got you. Up. So Brilliant. it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird, but it's not necessar necessarily like it doesn't change anything. Um, but it's, it's just kind landmarking, of like, isn't it? Just yeah, navigation. Yeah, it, exactly. So you're navigating by landmarks, it and it just means that if Players don't just go. I go north. You just you you go whole went so whole wood. It and also I just helps I don't know, I like it a lot. understand the directions more. And with using mm. landmarks, it helps them build. If you know, if it's if it's totem, it helps them build the map in their minds better because then they're going to retain it more by understanding the direction and the closeness of other places. I think I would agree with that. It gives you a better picture of bit better picture of the world kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's very that's very good. Um, I like it a lot, and I, I love the yacht system. It just yeah, makes me, me it just makes me lol. Oh, you know, um, I've always thought of um, Andy Hop as the uh, American uh, Walcock. I think he is in a lot of ways. He is, he's yeah, he is a bit like that, and mm -hmm. he he has a good talent for putting out really useful products. But speaking of useful, 
let's talk about character options, shall we? Because this is like, this is this is where the real meat and potatoes is. And in fact, if you want to play play a character made of meat and potatoes, you can. Um, <laughs> you can. But yeah, so you've got your basic mutant, right? And these are called bodles, um, which means beings of dubious lineage. <laughs> now these are considered by some to be descendants of the human racians, and these guys are, as the book puts it, beyond description because each one is so different. And they essentially look like a jumbled up bin of human body parts and mutations. So the one in the book, for example, has got a hand for a face, giant ears, yeah, a little yeah. squid-like beard. And uh, yeah, he's wearing, uh, he's got like eight eyes and two noses. So it's like, you get the, you get the picture. But Cremphilians, these guys are called. They're the Twinkie race, right? But they can be any cake product. You don't have to be a Twinkie. But most of them belong to a religion called Jemima's Witnesses. Because you know yes. the uh, Aunt Jemima maple syrup bottles? Yep, yep. Um, yeah, so they're, 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 I think that is pretty cool. And essentially, they believe that the human racians were evil and despised them for encasing in plastic tombs, which is basically their, their packaging. So the Cremphilians have been alive for you know, centuries after the nuclear war, but encased in plastic until somebody <laughs> came and opened them. <laughs> yep. And that's depressing. That is ridiculous. <laughs> that's fucking crazy. It's crazy, isn't it? So good. It's it, it's mental, but yeah, there's there's an opposing religion to Jemima's Witnesses called human Humanitarians, and they worship the old ones and try to find artefacts of theirs. But anyway, I digress. We'll get into religions later. But um, other ring, uh, races include UFOs, which are aliens with a talent for mind magic. There's hawks, which are big, tough, snot creatures named after the sound you make when you're hawking up a, <laughs> yep. a loogie. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the, hang on, sorry. Or oh, oh, there's piles who are sentient mm. piles of trash. Lovely. Now, there's actually fucking loads of races, but these are kind of the greatest hits, as it were. But I won't bother listing them all, but I may talk about others later. But what I like about the race section is that it includes naming conventions for each race, their relationship to other races, and how they generally fight when uh, when their combat skills are being tested. For example, hawks, the snot men, they fight with something called a clobbering stick <laughs> yeah. and generally Clobberin engage stick. in the style of a violent maniac. So think Marv from Sin City. Yeah. That's, a, that's your basic hawk. He kind of keeps it simple, but the way it's written is that all of it is entertaining. Yeah. So you can get the picture, but the thing is, is that it's... Not necessarily all the text is there to be used in the game. Quite a lot of it is there just to be a good read yeah. and to be amusing. And it is really, really quite funny. I, I could never do it justice reading on here, as you probably no. can tell from earlier. But, but it's, it's I, really, I really funny. I love how, um, yeah, like you're saying, the, the structure of the words and everything, it is literally stupid and idiotic. But when you, like you say, understand it, it's so incredibly smart. It's, it's actually, it actually makes it quite immersive. And I've seen it done worse in a lot of other RPG settings, you know, mm. like especially ones from the 80s, Cyberpunk, for example, where it's trying to speak in this rad manner. And it's only <laughs> use all of the slang from the fucking game, but it's yeah. like, it's a He's bit found it. He's found it and it works. Oh, so yeah. yeah, hawks. They um they engage like violent maniacs. And as for names, they typ they typically name themselves after something they're known for doing. And an example in the book is Spleen Gobbler Hate Smith. Mm. <laughs> nice. It's <So, laughs> like a racist guy that eats spleens. Lovely. Or eat spleen. Yeah. I mean, nom, that's, nom, 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 nom. that's one way to win a fight, though, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you won't get away from that, are you? Now, as for racial abilities, so you kind of get the idea, right? Every every you know race has a, has a write-up like this, and they're all bloody funny, but racial uh, abilities, essentially you just get to pick from a few race-specific edges at character creation. So, like, there's usually two or three for each one. So an UFO might take, you know, mind control powers or mm, whatever. Okay. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about those when we get to edges and hindrances. But basically, the the, the book after the races prov provides like several examples of archetypes from within its universe. Because I know what you're thinking. It's like the setting is so mental. But what kind of people do we play? So yeah. we know the races that we're going to play. But archetypes, uh, for example, you have beast punchers, which are basically cowboys or ranch owners. And for those that don't know, because I, I wasn't aware of this, but it's um, the reason it's Beast Punchers is because another name for Cowboy was Cow Punch. Cow Punch. So that's what it is. But obviously uh. you don't, don't have cows in this universe. Um, you could be a gangster, a pimp, a smoothster, a Weisenheimer, a Price of Corn, which is a pirate. I like that. Or how about the 
How about the pedon? Pedon, where you are, <laughs> you are the lowest of the low oh. to the point where people piss on you. Oh, it's literal. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pedon. <laughs> it's great, though, isn't it? They're often slaves. Yeah. Or homeless, gotcha. which is uh, which is harrowing. <laughs> but but yeah, gadabout is another archetype listed in the book, and that's what the book's author is. For so gadabout, it's basically yeah. uh, an explorer. For yep. Don't do that, James. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't help it. <laughs> you want to do spells? You get a wand. You got a fucking owl. It'll deliver your meal. Deal with it. You twat. So this is a Savage Worlds product, so you can build your character any way you like. But you aren't limited to these classes. But they do serve as an idea as to what you might like to play. And this game has quite a sort of quite a strong gangster presence mm. to it, which is quite weird. But it, it <laughs> actually, it actually is really good. Like, do this combined with Wise Guys, and you've got a fucking game on oh, your hands. Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! Get that in the works. Yeah. What was that? What was your question, Nick? What were you just about to ask? Was it what? What about the spellcasters? Yeah. What about these spellcasters then? Well, I'm glad you asked, Nick, because uh, <laughs> I've lost my page. <laughs> yeah. So most Savage Worlds games have about two or three arcane backgrounds, which you can, uh, which you can use mm. in your games. But the core book of of Low Life has eight. Yes. <laughs> wow. So some of these have unique mechanics, and uh, some can use spells that others can't, and so on. But all of them have unique trappings for the spells, for which you don't know is just how your spells manifest. So let's say you play the Contaminator. Well, that means you're an elemental Zazwaggler, controlling the four <laughs> elements of filth, decay, disease, and feculence. Oh, yes. So nice. you could send balls of muck hurtling into opponent, attract garbage like a magnet to give yourself <laughs> yes. armour, or stick to walls using garbage juice. So it's pretty oh. fucking cool. <laughs> Bin juice. Oh my Whereas the, and another gross one is the uh, the zaz of a danged wrangler. So a danged <laughs> wrangler, so it's like dead wrangling, um, would yep. be different because dang danged wranglers specialise in stuff to do with the dead. They're necromancers, basically, and all their powers manifest, as the book puts it, totally goth nice <laughs> but here's the nice. thing each each different spell casting class has a different uh, fumble so if, if you roll a one on your spell casting mm. die with the dang drangler your spell becomes the spell becomes reversed but also becomes really happy and flowery so as a goth <laughs> you're gonna hate that like suddenly That's you're so trying good. to hurt the enemy but you heal them and little flowers grow on their head Oh, <laughs> but to you, so that's good. horrible. Yeah. <laughs> the example I came up with is if you're using the cadaver gab spell to talk mm. to a dead body, but roll a one. Well, maybe instead of the corpse talking to you, you speak to it and say something really nice. Do you know what I mean? It's like <laughs> I like your hair. The... What's left of it? <laughs> Damn. Um, yeah. So it's it's pretty pretty fucking cool. But I just wanted to talk about two more arcane backgrounds because there's there's quite a few actually. But mm. this one, the first one I want to talk about is the giggity gigger. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these guys, this is one of the more unique ones that I think is actually uh, a really good laugh if you're the type of character that likes to play by the seat of your pants because <laughs> it's pretty fucking cool. So, Giggity Giggers hunt these little creatures called Giggities. And Giggities are small triangular things that come in loads of shapes and sizes. And they each hold special properties. You can get flying ones, ground ones, and all of this stuff. But. The Giggity Gigger can extract from them these special properties, right? So these can be spells that the Giggity has stolen from another Zaz Waggler, or they can be edges, hindrances, whatever. So you don't know what you're going to get. It's completely random. Yes. Oh, um, oh, 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 there are some so things good. you can do to mitigate that, but um, essentially it's mostly random. But you can end up with a massive hindrance out of nowhere, which will last until the Giggity is, uh, decides to go his own way, basically. Um, so that is fucking cool. So that you could so end cool. up with an edge for the such a smart move. The cool thing about it, though, and I know you'll like this, Nick, is that is that as as a spellcaster, you're the type of guy that doesn't really mind the randomness uh, nope. of something like that. And I think you'll like this because you could get a legendary edge at level one by getting the right giggity. Um, that is crazy. That is crazy. So you can be super OP from the get go just with a bit of luck. Yes, you just need nice. the right luck. Yeah, um, it's <laughs> accidental really, really good. OP. I love it. Yeah, me too. And, but then uh, this game yeah. is accidental OP, just by the sound of it, you know, just by listening to it, it sounds nuts so it, it works. It is nuts, and, and a lot of it actually is quite unbalanced, but I think that actually only benefits uh, yeah, it. Exactly. We'll, we'll talk about that in, in a bit, but 
Yeah, so I could talk about the the the, uh, the smell caster as well, who will do, do all smell based magic, and this is a smell f- exclusive one, I believe. The weirdo or the hocus pocus or the dementalist arcane backgrounds, but we we're going to chat about the holy roller, holy holy roller. I never know how to say that, but holy, holy roller. Holy roller. The holy holy roller. Holy roller. Sounds holy roller. The holy roller. So religion. Last roll. Sorry. <laughs> It's uh, Reverend Nick, everyone. Hey, hello. So Nick. Namaste. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste. No, we don't do characters anymore. No, sadly. Hello? Who's that? Hello? Who's that? <laughs> it's the Reverend Nick. Oh my Nick. God. It's absolutely racist John. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we stopped doing it. You know what I hate? <laughs> Fuck off. N- no, get out. <laughs> God. So yes, religion is a big part of these games, and the Holy Roller is basically the cleric arcane background. And it's almost the same as Core Savage Worlds cleric stuff, but I think the religions are kind of the really cool part. So we mentioned humanitarianism and Jemima's Witnesses, but the other religions in uh, this section of the book uh, called Holy Crap include uh, yes. Bulgarianism, yeah. <clears throat> who worship a big dung beetle in the sky. Lovely. G- Jeezel Freakism, who worship an ancient musician called Jelvis. Jel- <laughs> so basically all of your cleric powers are now Elvis-based. Brilliant. Um, and there's a religion that worships an evil god called Stan, basically Satanists. So they're called Stanismists. <laughs> Stanismists. Oh, God. It's really annoying to say, but I think that's for purpose. Yeah. But the religions are really great for story seeds and for motivating characters. And they're such a big part of the setting that Andy Hopper made a whole second book about religions. And so, lads, we are going to play a game, Andy Hop or Andy Nop. (laughs) Um, You have to guess whether each of the following religions is made up by me or if it comes from the religion expansion from Low Life, also called Holy Crap. Yeah, Hop or Nop. All right, the first one. Atheists. Spelt, it's, their name is spelt with loads of A's so that they always appear at the beginning of every list. <laughs> Would you reckon is that not hop or not? It's it's genius, whoever made it. I but, think it's um, not. I think it's not. No, that is actually one of the religions that's from hop. the book. Okay. Yeah, that's hop. That's real. The Dong Fonders. That's not. Ah, oh, mate, that's got to be not. No, those are in there. No Fuck, way! So, there's an area of the game called the Dingdom of the Dong, and the guy, <laughs> the, <laughs> the leader there, <laughs> the leader oh. there, his name is Dong, so they're fond of him, so they're the Dong Fonders. So good. Um, the Munt Funglers. That's, oh, that's got to that that be a nop. Yeah, that's me. That's me. That uh, big, the Big Babies. Uh, hop. Hop. Yeah, that's right. You're right. That's him. Uh, that's a real one. Uh, Crimson Frinzelism. I feel like that's a knock because it's too much. Nick? Yeah, I'll go knock. I'll go knock. Yeah, that one I did made up. And the, yeah. the very final religion, not of this oithlings. <laughs> oh, that's definitely a hop. Hop. Yeah, that's real. That's real. E- but the cool thing, there's about 60 religions in that book, which is pretty ah, cool. It's yeah, because like, that was an expansion, major... wasn't it, that come out? Exactly. After, and this, yeah. It's, it's even got like it's got more shit in there it's really mm-hmm. really fucking good it's worth it isn't it it's, it's got like new races new it. powers new uh, like 10 main religions and then like loads and loads of sub religions like you know like cults basically yep but since we're on the subject of religion and magic let's talk spells so the game uses the Savage World's core spells but it also adds in a couple more for example, one we've already mentioned is Cadaver Gab, which is a danged wrangler spell that allows you to speak to the dead. Nothing special, but here's a couple of cool new spells for you. Um, Conjure Contaminants is a cool spell. Obviously a contaminant spell, but it grows stronger as you increase in rank. So basically nice. you summon a filth monster. Yep. And at novice, it'll be a wuss or a feck, but a legendary, it's going to be a badass or a raunch. Ooh. So... Um, and those the stats for them are actually listed in the book. Those are so you can get a, um, what is it a feck a feck contaminant or a wuss <laughs> contaminant. So yeah, those are the different like ranks basically. Yeah, I gotcha. Transmogrifies is another cool one which allows the spellcaster to mutate his foes from a random table of music mutating. Nice oh, from a random man. table of mutations. And 
on this table, um, you have a location, then the effect. So you could have your enemy's teeth triple in size, yeah. or suddenly their <laughs> knee is covered in eyeballs. <laughs> yeah. Or you could have a part of them suddenly become useless and limp, or suddenly maybe their eyeball gets covered in eyeballs, which is a disgusting thought. Oh, oh yeah. God. The eye of yeah, eyes. So, there's not like a huge amount of spells in here because the Savage Worlds is already pretty comprehensive what, yeah. what you can do because of trappings, but the mm-hmm. new ones are pretty fucking good. Yeah, I like it. Me too. So um, yeah, what, one last thing we want to talk about in character options is edges and hindrances. And edges, for those aren't, uh, that are unaware, are unique abilities or mechanics um, a character can have. Hindrances being your character's shortfall. And this game does something particularly cool with them. So in normal Savage Worlds, you have major or minor hindrances, right? And each one gives you a certain number of extra points towards character creation stuff like wealth, new skills, extra edges. But this game introduces the doozy level of hindrance above. It's it's a level of hindrance above major, which nets you four Ooh. points towards other shit. So examples of this are limbless. <laughs> Mouthless, blind is also been changed to be a doozy. Now, limbless characters get minus eight to all physical actions. Fuck here now. Wow. But remember this: it's not necessarily that bad if you're a spellcaster. Yeah. You get okay. you get your mates to wheel you around in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> you're just a little blob firing off spells. You could just yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love that's it. A, that's a good way. That's like my very short guide to min maxing low life. You need a wheelbarrow, you need limbless, and you need to buy as many spellcasting edges as you can. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, other hindrances include Hordosaurus, where um, you have to roll spirit. Anytime you want to use an item or get rid of an item, you have to roll spirit to relinquish the item from your inventory because you just love hoarding shit. Nice, yeah. There's also Stanky which gives you a minus two to persuasion and stealth as long as the person you're sneaking up to or talking to can smell you. <laughs> you stank. And this goes doubly for smelfs, which are huge-nosed creatures with smell-casting powers. Smell-casting. I love it. But yeah, anyway, the edges are where the book really shines. So for mm. each race upon character creation, and you're going to see, like, I was going in a kind of certain direction with these, right? Because... Right, uh, anyway, um, so each uh, upon character creation, right, every character gets to pick from a couple of race exclusive edges. For example, Bodles, the animal or the animal version of Bodles called Tizents, can start with uh, the edge big ass feet or big ass ass. And <laughs> big ass ass. <laughs> big ass ass. <laughs> This guy's got a big ass ass. <laughs> the feet basically give extra jumping height and kicking damage, whereas the ass absorbs full damage and allows you to bounce up higher than jump height. Nice. Yes. Nice. Now, what I love about the uh, this section particularly is it's not completely PC. So there is an edge called Pimp Slap, <laughs> where you get a bonus to slapping people that are smaller than you. And... <laughs> And if you combine that with a big ass hands edge, then you've got a recipe for a pretty good pimp. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, there's another a good edge for the pimp would be the booty hunter edge, oh, wow. where you gain a bonus if you're tracking a woman or a man, if that's your preference, with a nice bum. <laughs> <laughs> Just and then that there's obviously what was his ass like? I need to know so I can track him down easy. And he's like, oh, it's shaped like a peach, and he's he's like in a crowd, and he's like, do 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 do, like the fucking. Case. <laughs> Like his yeah, sort of shirt Terminator vision come, Yeah, Terminator vision on, on point. <laughs> As detected <laughs> Come here, maybe <laughs> But yeah, there's also just a uh, There's also just the pimp edge itself It's a background edge So the book, the book puts it like this, right? It says, your life as a pimp starts with the one strumple in your stable So brothels are referred to as a stable Which I just find so funny I just imagine, I oh know this is a terrible image But a bunch of sort of mutant women standing there Eating hay, you know, just in their little boxes <laughs> Yeah The pimp coming in, like pouring a bit of slop in there um, Gesturing to them yeah, yeah, but basically, yeah, um, yeah, the way this pimp edge works is that as you increase in rank, you get more strumples as henchmen. So at Legendary, okay. you have 16 loyal hoes that nice. follow you around everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, as you can see, I went a bit all in on the pimp edges because I thought they were funny, but they're so yeah. good. And the others yeah. are great too. So, for example, Lashmaster, it gives any slaves that you own plus one to actions when they're standing next to you. Price of corn allows you to change your wild die to a D8 Ooh. when you're on a ship. Oh my god. But Ooh. the best one, evil twin. It means that when your character dies, this is a background edge, when your character dies, they get replaced by their evil twin. <laughs> yes. And the requirements for the edge, right, is that your character is not already evil, obviously, and doesn't have a beard. Because when your evil twin joins the party, he has a beard, obviously. Yes, He's got like a little course. evil goatee. Got to, got to have it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, conversely, there is a good a good twin edge too. So it's you know, if you if you want to do it the other way around. Yeah. Okay. But that's mostly it for character creation, lads. Uh, oh. The gear section is pretty great. It mostly consists of like fantasy type items with a few odd ones thrown in, like a throwing hat, like odd job, <laughs> yeah. um, or <laughs> yes. the big the big fork, which is an armor piercing cutlery weapon, <laughs> nice. or the war mitten, that's also <laughs> a slapping weapon. Um, one for the pimps there. Nice. Yeah, so it's pretty fucking cool. But one great feature is the weapon customization. So there's a shop, like an in-world shop, called mm-hmm. Wacky Wongo's Workshop, where you can <laughs> customize items. Or, or you can just use this system where a player wants to create an item. So you pay for certain levels of damage or additional effects for each. Okay. Disarming abilities or maybe the ability for a weapon to return when thrown. But, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. That's it's pretty wicked. nice. Um, yeah. But, yeah, after the gear is the monsters, and we'll get to those, and I realise that I actually haven't written any of them up. Um, <laughs> so we won't get to, Well, we might get to those. But before we do, I just want to take a peek at the world. I, I won't go too in-depth here because, you know, um, we could be here all day because it yeah. is actually quite fucking deep. But um, It is. Yeah, it's, it just is. A, it's astonishing how deep it is, considering how... You know, if you're just picking it, the book up for the first time, or you read like a passage from it randomly, you think, "What the fuck is this? This is this this read stupid." But then, yeah, the whole world and everything is deep as fuck. fuck. It yep. really is. So when we played, if you remember, we played like a you know a couple of sessions of it, right? Mm. And uh, yeah, the where we played it was a town called uh, Agog. It's uh, it, well, it's actually called the, the Empirical Terrarium of Agog, the Blood Sodden Sog. And uh, this basically, this is like a tribal, like crime field hawk town ruled over by a snot man called Fist Pounder Gavel Banger, who sits on a throne made of smelf bones. And the adventure we did took place in the Museum of Things That Are No Longer Yours, containing evidence of basically hawk, you know, conquests over other peoples. Um, but there's also a pretzel forge here, where pretzels are made from a flower of ground up smelf bones served with smelf blood sauce. Wow. Ooh, and of okay. course, I already mentioned the Kremfilian town, the uh, Dingdom of the Dong. And this place is basically an archipelago, which is at war with itself, because there's so many Twinkie-based, cake-based gangs all vying <laughs> for territory. And listen, each place has notable locations in it. And notable locations uh, in the Dingdom of the Dong include Mount Funky and uh, Borkel Bleak, which is a giant rock within which dwells a pile, a trash guy, who meditates encased inside forever. Lovely. So you get the picture here, right? Other oh, amazing mate. locations that I would... would uh, Other amazing locations that I won't get into include that one place with all the sand, flooded crust, some rocks, and <laughs> the yuck. And <laughs> the there's yuck. one called, simply, don't go here. Nice. So what's that place and, like? You've got to go there. You don't just yeah, don't tell even me ask, one mate. player that don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the trouble, isn't it? I, just say, no, I get a bit go. nervous, so what am I like when we're playing? If something sounds mm. a bit risky, I do get a bit scared. You well, do, we can actually hear it in your in your um, voice, not in your character. You sure it's a good idea, guys? Normal... <laughs> <laughs> like, it does um, say don't go there. You just sort of like there's a little quiver at first, but then obviously you play into it uh, later. <laughs> but you're just like uh, um, <laughs> um okay. <laughs> do, uh, should we go there? Is uh, yeah, but I mean, I, uh, the reason I don't really want to spoil it is because I kind of really want to get it and actually play this uh, for yeah. a campaign. So, um, but yes, great locations. They're all kind of weird. Now, the world of low life is absolutely huge. So, there's a campaign setting for it outside of just the whole thing, but it details a previously mentioned area called Keister Island, where the Oith's butthole is. Yes, uh, a huge nuclear crater. So. The book is called The Whole Hole and details all the locations on Keister Island, uh, in, including the Garden of Smellamental Glee. But what's, <laughs> what's cool, right, is that it includes new hindrances, edges, races, equipment, and all of that too. Now, I'm just going to talk about extras, supplements, and assorted jazz, right? Because the religion supplement and the Keister Island one are so worth it just for the new races. The Whole Hole, for example, you've got the fungi mushroom people or the snail who are quiet like mostly people m- mostly peaceful snail people and you've got the flu which are like huge fly people um, but in the religion book you have seven new races including probably the most famous race in low life the coblin yes so, 
Andy's convention that he runs is called Con on the Cob and features these guys as the mascot and even makes corn-based trophies in the shape of these guys. They're essentially Corn on the Cob people who can explode themselves, sending giant kernels in every direction, and then they have to wait three days for it to grow back. But yeah, these are like really cool, cool race, man. But essentially, they're always very angry. So at any point, they can just boil over and they suddenly <laughs> send kernels flying everywhere. So they're pretty cool. That's brilliant. They've got anger trigger. But yeah, many of the edges and hindrances are exclusive to certain races. The supplements are so worth getting if you want the full range of character options because there's certain edges that only a Coblin can take that are really fucking good. So yeah, I mean, it does mean you end up with about 20 races, but I don't think it, I don't think it's overly complicated. It just means you've got a couple more character options than you usually yeah. would in Savage Worlds. But yeah, um, before we kind of get onto our thoughts for the thing, like, I just want to talk about one accessory that I think is is a must-have if you're going to fucking play low life, right? And uh, it's the Misadventure deck. Ooh. So in Savage Worlds, right you have accessories called Adventure decks, and they work thusly. Each player draws one card from the deck for each rank they possess, and they can play one of those cards at any point during the session. And it can have effects ranging from making an enemy's weapon backfire to gaining an important clue to killing every every extra in the room with one sex successful attack. Low Life's Misadventure deck is slightly different. Everyone just gets one, regardless of rank, and used cards get shuffled back into the deck. But unlike normal adventure cards, a player can spend a Benny at any time to receive another and still use it. And players aren't just limited to using one or two or three. They can use as many as they want. So you get awarded a Benny and just go, fuck it, I'm gambling. I'm going to take another adventure nice. card. It's really cool. And That's the cool, cool. cool thing is, is that this deck and the cards within often have like a cost to them. So it's not just a good effect. So there's one that makes you walk really wonky for the rest of a combat, slowing you right the fuck down and giving you a minus two to all rolls, but you're also really difficult to hit because you're just fucking jerking all over the place. So enemies have a minus four yes, to hit mate. you. That is cool. That's so smart. Yeah. I think this is my favorite one. It's just, it's just called Chill for a Bit. Um, <laughs> where, chill for a Bit. Where a com uh, the combat automatically stops in 2d4 rounds. So everyone, the enemies and you, all have a break for for a round and, and have a snack and try to do a bit of healing and it's sort of like both sides are sitting there going oh, when I've had this fucking sandwich you're a dead man shut up <laughs> and, then, and then they'll get back into the fight later on yeah. nice mate there's, there's one called too soon where you have to tell a joke so offensive that everyone in the vicinity is shaken <laughs> <laughs> oh we had that in our game didn't we yeah, we had that in our game, and another one that we had was Late to the Party, where you arrive two rounds late to the combat, but when you do, you're right behind the enemy. Which is nice. Cool. That's cool. That's really cool. So, that is that is pretty much it. I mean, monster-wise, I'm just... Uh, uh, there, there's a lot of weird... I'm just, the two I can remember, Brocodile, which is half broccoli and half crocodile, <laughs> and, um, of course, there is the Oily Boyd, which is an oily bird. Cut, so it's like a really horrible, disgusting bird covered in oil. I'm also looking at a mutant land fish on my screen right now, as well as um, an ogre called an odor, which is a big smelly blob of flesh. So yeah, Ooh. pretty cool. So um, yeah, that's low life. Um, I'll get your guys' thoughts on it. So Nick, how about you? You start. As a, as a huge post-apocalyptic fan, you know, it's always going to be something I'll be interested in. But then when you look deeper at it, and it's, like you said, a post-post-apocalyptic uh, game where, you know, the, the disaster is over many years ago, everything... Oh, I forget what it's called in this now. The um, the Flush. The Flush, yes, exactly. So that was the, the event. And this is, like, a long time after where whatever semblance of society is left is now a full-functioning society in its own right. And that's what makes it so clever, because... It's I don't know. Just have to completely rethink the whole way the whole way everything works and and try and bring structure to madness. And it's great. And that's why I like it so much because even though it is crazy, it's not. If you look at it, there is there, there's it's there, actually it's actually like there. quite a lot like a normal fantasy game or a lot like real life because everyone talks in this weird modern way and yep. there are shops and stuff like this. So it's just that one level of weirdness re removed where. The stuff you're doing could be almost normal, but then you realise that you're trying to break into a museum that's an endless maze guided by a man made entirely of snot. Do you know what I mean? It's exactly. Like, yeah, love it. 
but, and it's um, just clever it's just i don't think there's so much to work with in it so you can literally mm. do any theme you would like within low life and it would be a kind of you know something interesting but it's also something familiar as well it's, it's great it's, i think you can have no, a lot I- of fun with it I agree about that because it's like I'm aware that it's a silly setting and not to be taken seriously but in a post-apocalyptic game the game is usually about surviving and it's usually about scarcity and in this it's kind of more about well it's not, it's not about that so it can be anything you want I mean I played um, when I actually played with Andy Hobb we played an investigative game uh, when we played it we played a gangster game yeah. um, and you could easily do uh, dungeon exploring going down human racy and um, structures do you know what I mean mm-hmm. I mean, it, yeah. it's really whatever you want it to be exactly. which is kind of cool and that's what Although, I like about I, it I wonder if you could do effective horror in a game that's so silly that you don't know because the thing is the big part of a, maybe a horror where there's a monster involved is seeing the monster but everything in this is a monster so I mean, that's true but know. then you could go you could, I mean you can go you can go for the visceral gross out can't you because there's extra levers I mean you've already got it baked into the whole setting it's kind yeah, of that's gross a good point. but then you yeah. can like really ramp up the gross I guess uh, totally. to bring in that kind of horror that kind of macabre side of it but um, yeah no it's 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 yeah you can make a pretty good hellscape in, in, uh, <laughs> in, totally. in, in that can you James, how about you? Do you like it? Is it nice? Oh, mate, it's fucking... It is astounding, isn't it? Because I was there yeah. with you when um, you you bought the supplements and everything, and then you mm. just like, oh, I've got some money saved away. I don't know if I should get it. And then, like, you disappeared for a little bit, came back, and was like, yeah, I've got them all, mate. I've got them all. <laughs> and it's just like, it's fucking awesome. The artwork is phenomenal and it's all drawn by Andy himself. Oh, that's... He's yeah, we, we forgot to mention that. Oh, my God, God, yeah. Does the, his, the guy's an is, artist, yeah. <sighs> I just can't. I, that's the only one thing I think that um, Walcock has. has the, the, the difference between Andy and Walcock is that. <laughs> he said yeah. that Walcock's not an artist. Well, but well, Richard Walcock's the layout guy, Andy's the fucking. He's the artist. But for those. Yeah. Um, you know, just go and look at some of Andy's art because it's basically like 90s gross out humour. So if you imagine like Garbage Pal Kids, it's, yeah, a little, exactly. it's like that style. Um, and he absolutely smashes it. And what's kind of cool is that because the art has such a large focus in the book, there's little Easter eggs and things like this. So there is a hidden message, I think, at some point in the book that tells you to look for snails. And in certain pictures, there's, there's tiny little snails that are hidden away in the background or whatever. And I, I don't know why, it's just... That little thing is, is quite 90s to me, and I fucking love it. Yeah, it's, it's wicked. It's really awesome. And I think, like we were t- saying earlier, it's like just how smart all of the silliness is. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It, it, I mean, every single time it amazes me. You know, when you hear these little um, like quirks and stuff that, you know, I've maybe heard before or, you know, we discussed um, earlier about the, the way that the certain edges work and mm. stuff like that. It's just like... Oh my god! It makes so much sense, but when you just without understanding the sense, if you just didn't get it, it is just stupid. But yeah. I mean, you, but you get it, you yeah. get it, and it makes full full sense. And it's just like yeah, that I, is uh, smart. I think, um, uh, yeah. One one of my favorite. If I was to compare it to another saying, I would probably say Planescape. And I know Planescape is supposed to be taken seriously. The trouble is with Planescape is everything has a really very specific way that it works. And it, it's what simultaneously makes the game great, but also very difficult to get into. This game, although it has, it is completely weird, and you could turn a corner and see just about anything, it also has... Um, a certain level of a certain level of weird where it's like it's not going to baffle anyone you yeah, still yeah, get yeah. your place in the world you still get the way the world works it's everything is weird but it's to the point where everything is so weird that i don't think it's a way it's one where you feel like you should be reading up on it no it's, d- no not at all yeah it, it's it it's like it's like what you know and what you like and what you're familiar with but then with all this crazy wicked stuff kind of put on top of it Totally, and and you know, in the two, three sessions that we played of this, um, I really, I, I really found that it was just easy to slot into, and it's one other one of those ones where because it's so weird, players feel like they've got that freedom to be as it's weird and as stupid as they want. It's comfortable. Yeah, that's yeah, it. that's it. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 It's the reason Saga of the Goblin Horde works and Wise Guys and this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I tell you so what, um, I do have a theory, and I, and I think this is—I'm going to go on a slight rant here. 
But here's, here's my theory. So one of my favourite musicians in the world is a bloke called Daniel Johnston, who became famous because Kurt Cobain wore one of his T-shirts, right? And I, can't, I don't know how old he was when he recorded his album, but they're very, very, very low quality and display sort of actually kind of a... Uh, not real talent for music but they are actually really great songs and I really like them and what that type of art is known as is outsider art right because he's a guy that isn't necessarily involved in music the music industry music production and as a result creates something really really unique now I'm sorry if this sounds offensive in any way if Andy is listening to this but I get the impression that he's not actually a big RPG guy and the reason I think this is because the way the book is structured is it's structured more like a world book about his art and then at the end, so you have a whole section on all the spellcasters, what they do, how they do it, and then at the end it repeats the same section and added in are the ways the spellcasters work. Added in are what edges the races get. So I think that he was writing the world book, then decided kind of halfway through that he wanted it to be a game. Do you see what I mean? And yeah, chose yeah, Savage Worlds. Yeah, I gotcha. And there was absolutely nothing wrong with that, but I find that, that what what, it, what makes the book great is its commitment to fun over balance, right? And I feel as if that could only come from a perspective where you're kind of an outsider to the hobby. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 so I get that's, you. that's my little theory. I don't know if it's true, but he does run it every year at Con and the Cobb, but the way he does it, he kind of does like weird challenges that you yeah, need to yeah. do to actually succeed in, in challenges. So it could be you have to play him at rock, paper, scissors. You have to arm wrestle him. You have yeah, to physically wrestle him. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's like he's a guy that just, he likes the improv of it. He likes the world building and he's put out this product for people to play as a game maybe being a bit of an outsider but it actually resulted i think in a better product yeah and he and he picked the perfect system for for, for which to use that you know totally who helped totally. him along who helped him along with the uh, i think Lords? i'm fairly certain him and hensley shane hensley were were, were close but I, d- I don't know i might be wrong with that but i think he knows oh. jody black and clint black as well so uh, okay yeah. because that's you know that's that's very telling that if it, if your theory is correct then yeah, they uh, the assistance provided to help you know make this come to life. Well, in and, terms and bear in mind this worlds. is um, this is the second edition that I've got. So original one was just yeah. called Low Life Rise of the Lowly, and it was um, well, it's not black and white, but it, it was kind of green, black, and white. Um, and then the this one is Rise of the Lowly redragged from the muck by Andy Hop. So. Yeah, this one is like the full color version, the really nice one. Um, I've got the two expansions as well. So, but yeah, it's um, oh, I love it. I mean, even if you just, even if you think it sounds too stupid, just read the world setting stuff for the humor because it's so funny and so. The thing is, brilliant. it also spark. Um, I think it will spark something inside you to. Uh, it will help you out in your own campaigns. Just oh, because yeah. it's stupid um, and stuff doesn't mean it'll put you off. It'll it'll feed you ideas because you're just like. He's just, um, yeah. Because imagine if, imagine if I, if uh, imagine if I took this setting, and then when, uh, okay, a pimp with a giant hand. Right, I'm putting that in our wise guys game. Suddenly, yeah. the new bad guys. This guy with a huge deformity, where he's got a massive hand and he's going around slapping people to death. Johnny the slap. Exactly. Johnny the exactly. slap. <laughs> <laughs> it's massive and Dan. Massive hand, Dan. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that is it for low life. Uh, if you can't tell, we really like it. And I am yeah. giving it a ten out of ten. It's not just because he gave us an award. All right. All yeah. right. But yeah. it helps. So I'm busting it up to an eleven. There you go. <laughs> anyway, yeah, this is easily one of my favourite settings. Haven't played as, as much as I would like, but I absolutely love it. I think the language is great. I think that the creativity is amazing, and I love yeah. it when somebody does something different. So yeah, Agreed. definitely go out and buy it. It's brilliant. Although. I was trying to buy before we get onto electro letters, right? Andy also designed another game called Gazoink, which is set yep. in the same universe as Low Life, and it's basically each player takes the role of a giggity gigger, the magic casters, right? And you're all competing to get better giggities, so ones that are worth higher card amounts. Yeah. Um, I can't exactly remember how to play it, but he um, released an expansion for Gazoink called Chunderstorm, and it's the drinking <laughs> game version of it. And it, yeah. it is fucking like Andy can really yes. hold his hold his liquor and and oh, mate. 
I weird. played it, and bear in mind it was a table of about twelve people. So to get to when it got to your turn, it was a couple of minutes, you know. Oh, and man. I was fucking hammered after about two <laughs> rounds. It was like <laughs> it was like somebody will play a card, and it's like the player steals a card off you, and you have to drink your entire drink. And I'm like, oh my god, another one! Like, I only just drank an entire drink two minutes ago, and I was like, no, I'm going to bed. See you later. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I was trying to buy it off his website, and currently the shop is down, and I don't know why. Oh, but um, uh, but, well, yeah, just see if you can find it somewhere. It's fucking great. Yeah, I think it's on Drive Through RPG and Amazon. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's do some military letters, shall we, lads? Yes, mm. please. I need to go to Luke, really. All right, cool. That's yeah, so do I. Well, let's take two, two minutes and uh, leave your recording going. We'll do. And here they left the lonely traveller. All on his lonesome, in the room, on his own, with no one around him but himself, because he was on his own. In the future, you will be able to send a letter or parcel from anywhere on the planet. This, sir, is the Electro Letter. <laughs> That's bad. That? <laughs> 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 that was a sigh. The recognised uh, return <laughs> from a piss. Hello. Oh, oh where he is. Hello. Are we on location in the loo? No, no, we're in my spare room. Oh, okay. Are you on location? No, no, I'm back. No, I'm not on location. It's just my, this room sounds like I'm in the loo because it's echoey now, but... <laughs> Um, you got uh, we got that creepy Thomas the Tank Engine wallpaper off though. That is so. Oh what? Oh yeah. What you want me to images. keep just that slither? You should at the have. Top? You should have like got Millie to paint like a really nice frame around it, so <laughs> <laughs> like a piece of art. Oh, so I can't believe you're disappointed by you that. You missed the trick. No, yeah, we've only got we only got one more left to do. Oh, yeah, I was just I, I was just checking on my booze in the kitchen as well. No, it's it's currently fermenting. Oh yeah, how's it coming? It's good, man. Um, it's weird because I, th- I thought it was supposed to slow down about now, but it's still fermenting, which means that it's probably going to be quite high alcohol content, uh, which is exciting. Oh. Does it need sunshine? But you've I guess got a tester, don't you? No, it has to be. Yeah, I've got a tester, so it needs to be in the dark. And the way you measure the alcohol level, you measure it just when you start, and then at the end, and the differential right. gives you yeah what it is. But Ooh. yeah, so it has to be in the dark. So I put it in the boiling cupboard, the mm. boiler cupboard, and um, the apple one that I'm making um, was like bloating out really hugely. I was worried it was going to explode, but finally it <laughs> it's it is actually. Down, is it? Yeah, it's calmed down. It's, yeah, I saw it bubbling away just now, so it's all good. The gas I is love escaping. The little apparatus that plugs into the top. It looks just from proper Wilco, chemistry. Mate. It looks proper chemistry. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah it, was, it was from Wilco, three quid. Really? And you, it, you can hear it all day going, whoop. That's whoop. so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. All righty. So uh, this week, we didn't really have a subject for Electro Letters from you guys, but we had a couple of, uh, well, we'll, well, I mean, we well, can you know. call them mail if you want. <laughs> if that's what you like. So Ian Tutwiler, he says, Some RPGs slash adventures have you play lengthy games within games during your session. For example, Tower of the Stargazer instructs the GM to play a game of chess with a PC. How would you tell your mates that they need to wait out a session while you play chess with (sighs) one player? How would you tell strangers at a con? You can't change the game to Twister like a sensible GM in this scenario. You can only run as written. How can you live with yourself afterwards? So I guess the the parameters here is that you can't just say, no, I wouldn't run that adventure. Mm. So Nick. Uh, right, so I would um, <clears throat> I would explain to the, the guys that the, this chess game is an imperative part of the story. Um, and I would probably just hype it up to a point where all the people that weren't playing the chess game <laughs> were still really, really engaged in the fucking game somehow. <laughs> So you just be like, oh, like he, he, slam he the chest it. board on the table, so all the dice go flying, mm. and I'll be like, throw so, them away for an hour. <laughs> to, like you just be overly enthusiastic. About Shit's it. getting real as I start putting the chess pieces down. The way I imagine it is kind of like um, if you had. Um, like you know when if you've ever seen people celebrate at a rap battle when somebody does a sick diss yep, and everyone's yep, like yep. Oh! Whoa! Yep. it'd be like that you'd be doing that and hoping that the other players just Actually, sort of join I would in probably, I would probably then like you know maybe I could if it's at a con that we're running maybe we could hire some hype men to come in just at that point and it's like whoa 
Ooh, like the crowd just starts going. Whoa, crazy. shit, you guys playing chess? Whoa! Whoa, <laughs> Whoa my guy! <laughs> I, remember, um, I remember at Con on the Cob, the last time I went, there was um, uh, Eric's game, we're all playing wise guys, and every five minutes, all of them would go, hey, hey! <laughs> <laughs> and the whole table would just interu- uh, like erupt into that every, like, every five minutes. I'm trying to fucking play tough guys over the so other good. side. <laughs> Nice. All right. <laughs> that's um, what I would probably James... try to do. Yeah. I'd, I mean, if you're stuck, I mean, if you can't not do that, then I would have to try and make the. And obviously, I would condense the chess game. Um, you know. Well, what I would do is see if I can get them into a fours mate or whatever the fuck it's called nowadays. But uh, the four move. Um, that's it. Yeah. Win. And then if if I could do it, and if they weren't wise to my antics, then good. It's, it's over really quickly. And if I don't. I just tried to put myself in a position where they can win really quickly. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. How about you, James? Well, I'd either I'd either just try and you know explain. I'd either try and play it on the side because I, can you still play the game whilst, or you have to play chess and, uh, before it continues? I think the outcome of the campaign is crucial to playing it at that moment. Yeah, I think. Oh, in that case, I'd um, I'd uh, try and create a story out of uh, what's happening on the chessboard. So that it becomes more immersive, and then I'll allow uh, the yeah. one person who's playing it to announce what they're doing, but then another player, so that they feel more involved, make nice. the move, but then explain no, the action. I've clever. got it. Bu- building on build. That's clever. But building on that, right? Get each one guy to be the main chess player, and mm-hmm. then every other player controls just one pawn, and they have to role play all of their actions. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, I'm so going the, in, master. The chess game is a role playing game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's clever. That yeah, works. so so you got the player playing chess, but then as he moves a piece, then the other players can play the pieces. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then suddenly the one player's role playing the bishop, like coming up behind somebody. <laughs> yeah. and he's like, eh, here I am. <laughs> The thing is, it does work. Do you remember? Oh God, years ago now, um, Pathfinder, I think, when we uh, when Roland played the Russian roulette game with the devil. No, with death. Yeah, but I suppose we didn't actually stop the game and play Russian roulette. We were still rolling dice. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's true. But I think that would be. There's no way you wouldn't get hype about a real game of Russian roulette. I mean, it's hard not to. That's true. Um, Garrett Weinstein, he says, what's your favourite RPG book or tool for running the domain game? A domain being the player's secret lair, business, criminal syndicate, or feudal fiefdom, etc. Um, Well, I mean, it might just be recency bias, but I really, really do think that Wise Guys is the best one I've done for that. And and listen, hey... Hey, calm down a minute. I'm going to say something controversial. d and is quite good for it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. We played especially, a business game yeah, in that, didn't we? Exactly. And we got the uh, Acquisitions Incorporate book. That's quite a good one. Um, good. Gen Lab, uh, sorry, Mutant and Gen Lab, that's pretty good. I mean, it's all post apocalyptic, but it's all kind of a lot of it revolves around your base and building it, it up and it making really connections does, yeah. and stuff like that. That's yeah, because cool. uh, specifically the Mutant Year Zero one, yeah. a big part of the game is building up your base, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. There's a pretty cool one, a bit of a left field answer, but pretty cool one that I saw for Savage Worlds. It was Savage Ghostbusters. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, that <laughs> and a game called, a setting called Rippers. Um, mm-hmm. Rippers is good. Both have, uh, like, your lodge as a business that you can That's add it. features to. So, um, yeah, and you can get, like, edges for the lodge that'll be like, yeah. I don't know, things like your car is always fueled up every time you come back or nice. whatever. Do you know, yeah, things like cool. that. So, yeah. That's kind of a good one. Um but yeah, Gen Lab is a very good answer. Um, James, how about you? Mate, we just covered all of them. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right, okay, fair enough. Um, Terry Hansen, he says, "What is your favourite coffee or tea brand?" And he's got a couple of things like this. So, uh, yeah, let's get into those. James, how about you? Favourite coffee or tea brand? Uh, Taylor's Coffee. Okay, they're good. Good choice. They're nice. Yeah, nice and strong. It's because it goes up to seven. You see, on the oh, roast you know what? scale. No, this is this is this is what um, annoys me, and a lot of people, not a lot of people know this. I'm about to be a fucking snob, right? But strong co- if if you have the stronger coffee, it doesn't mean it contains more caffeine. What it means is that it's roasted for longer, therefore giving a more bitter flavour. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I like it, the bitter. Has, yeah, I like bitter. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I, I, I like both, but um, try a light roast once in a while. It's uh, it's mm. quite a treat. If you want to taste the flavours more, it's it's pretty nice. Um, Favourite t- t- coffee brand, though? I don't, I don't really fucking know. I mean... Currently, I'm the- drinking a whole jar 
of, because I'm working from home, of Marks and Spencer's Gold. It's quite nice. Oh, the instant stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I don't mind instant coffee. A lot of people turn their noses up at it, but I, I actually think it's all oh, right. Oh, it's easy. If and, I've got time to do oh. the... Um, I've got one of them metal ones that you put on the hob, you know, and it percolates yeah. through the... Mocha pot. The, Mocha. Yeah, them. That If you've got time for them, they're, they're cool, you know, but quick coffee, yeah. yeah I, can't, I like it, but it, I've also only got one. I can't one. do instant anymore. No, I, I don't mind instant, but yeah, I, as, as for brands, I don't really know. I don't really like any of the big coffee chains, but out of all of them, I think I, I prefer Starbucks the most because yeah. they do this, you know, like now all the coffee shops do these stupid fucking flavors. Um, <laughs> and I think if I wanted a normal coffee, so I prefer Costa. I would just Costa. have, a, if I wanted a normal coffee, I'd just have it at home, right? So yeah. Star, yeah. Starbucks has all the like the, the most sugarful fucking crazy fucking coffees. And I yeah. like they're a button presser. They don't actually, they're not a barista. They click a button and then the machine does it for them. Whereas Ooh. Costa, there's a technique involved. Oh, it's basically the fucking same. <laughs> I mean, and also all of them use the cheapest, shittest coffee anyway. Yeah, but that's my, that's, I don't enjoy Starbucks because you just, you go there for someone to press a button for your coffee. I like someone making it and putting some attention to detail. Ooh. Oh, they don't know. It's basically the same. They're basically just machines made of meat. <laughs> but um, I think we can all agree that Cafe Nero is the worst, right? Uh, no, Starbucks is the worst. Star- Cafe Nero is right. Starbucks is the best. Cafe Nero, I just, I think they also do the shittest food. Oh yeah, I don't really eat. Uh, to be fair, I haven't no, had coffee I've, from a see, shop I did for all ages. Right. I got some Deliveroo yeah. stuff from um, Nero recently. That's so was, funny because bang on, mate. I was walking I'd... through um, uh, Rygate Town Centre recently, and. I saw that, that um, Cafe Nero were doing um, deliveries, and I was like, "Who the fuck orders from Cafe Nero and Deliveroo?" What? And then, and now we've <laughs> discovered it's you. Now we know who it is. I'll tell you what is amazing yeah, coffee: uh, Blue Mountain Coffee from Jamaica. Oh my god, Yay. I had it out there. So nice. Millie got me some for my uh, birthday once. Oh, it's fucking great. Yeah, that's good coffee. Have you have you have you tried the one there where the monkey? Uh, well, it's not a monkey. It's like a. Well, I think it's a monkey where it shits it out and you you eat, uh, drink it. Oh God! Is it? Is it no? Um, is it? I thought it was a cat. Yeah, it's like it was a, a tree, cat or something. tree yeah. based cat or something. They like have that. to eat it first, and then they t- they 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 take it out of its shit and want to, it, the passing through of the beans make it a, a special flavor. Apparently, I haven't it's, tried. It's, um, oh my God! Supposedly, what it yeah. is is that it gets rid of the acidity. Uh, I tried it. Um, because a bunch of us, we had like a little coffee club at work, like sad acts, <laughs> but we got, um, we decided all to chip in a fiver and get some, and yeah. it was all right. It's not it's worth right. that amount of money, but it was <laughs> no. much, much smoother than it usually is. It's pretty good. Okay. Uh, Terry Hansen follows up with, what snacks would you recommend? Snacks, buddy. Snacks, Wait, buddy. Snacks, snacks, buddy. Um, what, in life or at um, the table? I think just in general. Let's olives. go in general because we've already done my, at the my table. Go, my go-to snack every week is a pot of olives, and that's why I am in such great shape. It's a vegetable, <laughs> though, man. That's, uh, I feel the same way because it's like they're the most delicious thing on the earth. Yeah. But they're, but they're sna- a vegetable oh, okay. that's oh. bad for you. What is oh. that? Oh, how dare they? No, that's a good. That's a good one. Um, pork scratchings. I'm into pork oh, scratchings. I'm, in, I'm, in pork, I'm into pork scratchings at the moment. Crisps and chocolate at the same time, James. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> James if you've never done it. Try it. James Fucking is so great. weird. He's like, it was like, was it cheese and onion crisps and a Mars bar at the same time? And Snickers <laughs> bar. No, oh. no, not Mars. Mars can fuck off at Snickers. Right. Okay. Oh. Marathon. Marathon bar. Marathon. Yes. <laughs> we're going back to the 90s so um, <laughs> snack wise I think my absolute favourite snack of all time is Jaffa Cakes Ooh. but how do you eat them see the th- well I, I just eat them normally um, I'm not I don't eat layer by layer but I did uh, I, when I was younger I did like removing the sp- I did like removing the sponge eating that and then obviously letting the melt the chocolate melt in your mouth so you're left with the little rubber jelly disc <laughs> but that's if you've oh, got I'm time. That's if you've got time in your hands. <laughs> like... But I, I do my yeah, shopping. Yeah, you don't have um, to talk for a little while. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do my shopping at um, at Lidl, right? And obviously they have all like the off-brand stuff. It's just the fucking same, but with different packaging. Doctor Choco. Um, yeah, exactly. Like things like that, and they've got Neo, which is their version of an Oreo, which actually predates Oreos, which is pretty funny. Their stuff's lovely. But, um, do you know what the little the little non-brand stuff is? Is it, you could I reckon if you did a blind taste test, a lot of it you wouldn't tell the difference. Yeah, yeah, it's really well, it's true. good. It's, they've actually done that on like, mm. some <clears throat> in, uh, supermarket comparison shows. Yes, yeah, I've their Twix but, is really um, nice. Yeah, well, it's um, great. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the the Jaffa cakes they do a pack of twenty four for seventy five p. I mean, that is that's a ridiculously low amount of money. Um, but I've gotten to the point now where every week when we go shopping, I buy one of those boxes and eat it as soon as I get home. The whole thing. 
I mean, that is terrible, isn't it? Yeah. That is also why I have maintained such a shapely figure. <laughs> Jaffa boy. <laughs> Uh, right, so crisps and chocolate at the same time, Jaffa cakes. All right, so he says, if you could have an intense carnal conversation with a dead celebrity, who would it be? Um, carnal meaning um, saucy, racy. Saucy? Sexy. What, a, a na- naughty conversation? Jesus. Mm-hmm, okay, good Is that your choice. Answer? Jesus. Hitler. We're like, hey, <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> Hitler! <laughs> Nick, how about you? What's yours? I'm just going to go normal then. If it's got to be a saucy conversation, I'll go Marilyn Monroe. Good choice. Good choice. I found out a scary yeah. fact about her, actually, the other day. So she's the same age as our queen. She's dead, Nick. I know she's dead, but obviously if they, she was still alive, she'd be the same age as oh, the right, queen right, of England. Oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> but she very much isn't. She. No, I know. I know. All right, cool. Um, that, the last question there by Terry was a bit shit, but um, Yorkus Rex, he <laughs> says, how can a role-playing game expect meaningful, immersive play without at least 23 unique polearm variants with separate stats for each? <laughs> I think he is making, he's making quite a good point there because, yeah, I, w- one of my favourite things is in Lamentations of the Flame Princess, it's just you've got small, medi- small medium, and large weapons if you need it. Mm-hmm. There you go, done. You never need more than that. But some players feel like they need it. I mean, look at some of the games we've reviewed on this show. It's just like stupid amounts of detail of things that players are never going to give a fuck about. Yeah. I mean... No, but some do, don't they? Yeah. Like, some people really get bogged down with the details. We're like, oh, my gear is this, because they're all about kind of fashion, in a sense. They're like, got the best gear. Uh, You know, I suppose they're building up the picture. You know, when you're playing, like, a video game, and and it, it really, realistically, it's the same kind of gab where it's just like small medium large and then there's a very small variance in damage and durability mm. and all this shit whereas natural fact it's just about fashion how it looks mm. yeah yeah it's just because you want a really specific type of pole yeah. arm you know and it's like <laughs> yeah. in um, in Mifarog, for example Varg Vikernes' role playing game oh, yeah. when he spends an inordinate amount of time on the fact that you could have a shield on your arm whilst holding four javelins and uh, and a sword in the other arm and throw javelins with that same arm. And it's like, who cares? All right, I get that it's more realistic, but the more detail you put in, the more the game slows down. Um, and I think it's yeah. quite a difficult like- balance to get. But when you, when you go too ham, you end up with fatal. When you go not enough ham, you end up with... Um, well, I, I can't say what I was about to say. Sorry. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Basically, yes. We agree, Yorkers. Um, Owen Lean. Yes. I actually think this is a great question. He says, which musical would you most like to play as a tabletop RPG? And the Ooh. reason I think this is a great question is because I fucking love musicals. Um, which, which I don't know if you know about me, but that means I think that I am a gay man. Is that right? I think so. I think that's how it works. But yeah, so musical that you would like to play as an RPG, Nick. Oh shit, house. Uh, uh, only because it's the last thing I've watched, and it'd probably be quite interesting. Hamilton. I haven't seen that yet. Ooh. I really want to. Um, I've heard it's great. Mm. Yeah, very good. Um, James, how about you? Book of Mormon. Ooh. Yeah, I think I think that would be good because it's um, it's quite funny, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, but it's also like what happens in it. You'd be, you'd have to be, you'd either be the, um, uh, what is it, the elder, the el- fucking, what are they called, the Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> um, you'd even, sorry, what are those things from Gremlins called? <laughs> no, you'd either be the Mormons or you'd be the um, the the people who are getting turned and like the the villagers, you know, when they go mm. when they're trying to get um, in on it and stuff. Like yeah, Salta Lake City and all this. Shit. Yeah, that would be oh, really yeah. good, man. Okay. Um, I I I think I well in the D and D game, I did do a dungeon based on Phantom of the Opera because that's that was good. So like one of my fucking favorites. That, that was really good. It's gonna be. But that would be a good uh, musical uh, game. The thing about it is, is that was actually already turned into an adventure for Warhammer, believe it or not. Uh. Um, I've got a really fucking good answer, and I know this will be fucking fun, right? There's a musical called Le, Ca- Le Cage à Folle, or The Birdcage, right? It was mm-hmm. later made into a film. But this, the, the musical, basically what it is, it's about a gay couple, and one of them has a son that he got, you know, when he tried it on with a woman, decided he didn't like it, and uh, yep. he's got a son, right? So... The plot of the movie is that the son has met this woman and they're going to marry, and now the two sets of parents are going to meet. 
but the gay one of the gay guys he doesn't want the the other the girl's parents to know that they're gay because they're like super right wing right so mm-hmm. she cross dresses as a woman and pretends to be the son's mum for the whole weekend and <laughs> the four of them are trying to just keep their parents from noticing right and i think yep. if you did that using the maid system right you play the son the <laughs> yes. the son the wife and the two gay blokes and uh, yeah that would make a fucking great great um thing in the musical it's kind of funny because at the end, the guy that's cross-dressing, he reveals it because he starts singing and he gets so into it that he just flings his wig off and then he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be a good one. That'd be um, good. That would be good. I just can't... I, I just think it'd be like... It'd be like kind of kind of mental, but they're a good one for role play as well. Chicago's pretty good because it's like... Yeah. All these women in prison that are trying to get famous via the murders they did of their husbands, and I think that'll be pretty cool. Just a prison-based yeah, RPG. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, those are my answers. Um, nice. He did. He did also say what um, I can't remember, but he said the converse. He was like, uh, "What RPG would you like to see turned into a musical?" And I think that's bloody stupid. But we've got two <laughs> more questions. We're running a bit long here. But John the Paladin, last time he sent us a, like a big list of questions, and we didn't get to two of them. Top three vampires. I'm going Nosferatu, right? Yep. Um, I should have thought about this before the show. Should we do one each then? So it's free. Yeah, let's let's do that. I'm going Nosferatu. I'm going Cassidy from Preacher. Nice. Oh, mate, you motherfucker. Did I take your one? (gasps) That is a good one. (laughs) Um, No, you know what? I'm changing my answer. I'm going Strahd von Zarevich. Yes. But the one from our Ravenloft campaign. Oh, he was the best. Come closer. <laughs> Come within melee range. <laughs> what about Bram Stoker's fucking, um... James with the big hair? You had a film, Bram Stoker's Dracula in the film. Oh, yeah, with the, the white, big, Gary the big white with the bonnet big hair. he had. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's like it. Keanu that Reeves one. in it. Yeah, that's it. Mm. James, top vampire. Yeah. Uh, well, the Drac, mate. It's got to be the Drac. The Drac. All right, cool. Eula. No the one went for Count from Sesame Street, so... Oh, yeah, that's mate. a shame. He's a great vampire. Although oh. you don't actually ever see him sucking anyone's neck out. That's the uh, the the outtakes. Yeah, that's the that's, that's a the Sesame bit you don't after see. Dark. It's <laughs> that's Sesame after dark. I like to suck. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Sesame after dark on the streets. I want to suck your blood. <laughs> Stuff it. Sorry. Yeah, top three board games. You I go, what's yours? Say you No, um what I've forgotten completely. Oh, um one I really like. I don't I'm not much of a board game guy, to tell you the truth. I don't particularly like any board games, but I have been quite enjoying Obama Llama recently. <laughs> okay. This is, a, this is a charade style party game where nice. yep. all of the answers rhyme. It's got three different events, but like all of the answers rhyme. So let's say for example, I pick up a card and it's got a celebrity's name on the other side and it might be Pikachu. And now I have to mime out Pikachu doing a poo. Pikachu. Uh, okay. Yeah, stuff like that's that. Pretty and good. All of that's them rhyme, and then you, yeah, basically you earn points, get to flip cards and match them, and it's quite good because pe- it's like the amount of times where people get, you know, like super frustrated because they're saying it, and people are saying the 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 right phrase for it, so they might be they might be going Pikachu doing a shit, Pikachu has got diarrhea, and it's like yeah. it has to rhyme <laughs> for fuck's sake, to rhyme. Yeah, yeah, I like that cool. one. It's, it's, it's always fun. a bit bit of a fucking laugh. Um, and the D and D board game, the original one. It's really good uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, James and I had a good, like, you know, five years playing that fucking board game. So nice. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, that's when uh, that's where Sean was killer DM, mate. Oh, yeah, we it's didn't we didn't like, realize. Kill you. <laughs> yeah, we didn't realize at the time that the uh, the DM player relationship was supposed to be, you know, um, that we're telling a story together. My brother would just be like, <laughs> "I've created a dungeon this week, and I'm gonna fucking kill you." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, he hasn't changed well, no, a bit, huh? has he? Thinking about it. <laughs> Yeah, TPK Sean. Yeah. How about you, James? Any that you like? So at the minute, the one that keeps uh, sort of feeding back um, board game-ish is the Munchkin card game because, you know, it's it's good. It's got uh, an expansion for it, which has really sort of changed up the dynamic of it. And so I've also got the Harry Potter version, which I gifted to Layla for her birthday. And the Harry Potter one is actually 
um, pretty awesome because the leveling in it is you, you become quite OP quite quickly, but as a result, all of the monsters, etc., are also OP, so it's instantly more difficult than your vanilla munchkin. I reckon everyone listening to this will probably know what munchkin is, but have you ever played it, Nick? Not <laughs> <laughs> I haven't played Munchkin, it's, no. It's basically Steve like... Steve Jackson game. Oh, I know, I know, I know. I remember the artist from... Yeah, I Dragon was going to mention that. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I am going to mention it. Because um, we were at um, Dragon Meet one year, and Nick was fucking pissed out of his mind. And there, there was a bit where... We were waiting for an auction to start, right? And we were bidding on shit. And uh, the Doug Kovacs, the author for Munchkin, was on the stage <laughs> doing a big speech. Of course, everyone cares about who he is. I, I didn't really either, but Nick um, no. didn't know who he was and didn't care. And we were like, that's Doug Kovacs, man. He's done art for DCC and shit like this. And then Nick was like, oh, he, who's he think he is? He's done one cartoon and he thinks he can talk for 20 <laughs> fucking minutes. Got like really belligerent <laughs> because your Whoops. time was being wasted. I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Doug. I didn't mean it. Doug that was Kovacs the same time when I sat at the front. Yeah, it's true. That's the same time when I sat on that chair at the front of the auction, just <laughs> larging it up for and about also, 20 he minutes. He went up to pay for his shit that he'd, he'd, that he'd auctioned, dear listener, and um, he was sitting on a chair because they couldn't get the card machine to work. He's sitting on a chair in front of the whole audience, and he looked like he was about to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so good. And I was also when, do you remember when he was battling against you in an auction? It's just like, no, like, Nick, stop you it. You don't need to go against your friend. I know, that was ridiculous. My, 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 my drunken brain was thinking, right, well, if we're both doing it, we're going to get it, one of us, <laughs> for the show. Yeah, you that was, I actually found that up. book. I actually found that book, actually, when I moved. Uh, it's in perfect condition. It's the GURPS <laughs> Discworld book, signed by one we of the should, artists. We should play that, man. It's, it yeah. looks so fucking good. But yeah, totally. Um, we, we, we back onto the subject of board games I can't play Munchkin and it's specifically because James and Millie are really good at it one of the main um, core rules of the thing is arguing with each other over which rules work and how the rules work and also like trying to get as OP as possible hence Munch, Munchkin is also a term for a min-maxed RPG character right. it's fucking horrible to play with people that know <laughs> what they're doing it is miserable <laughs> Oh, but it is, I can I can attest to the fact that he's a good fucking game though. But um, yeah. how about you, Nick? Favorite board game? Oh, it'd have to be the one board game I've played probably the most forever. It always comes out at Christmas since I was a kid, and that's Border Dash, mate. It's a fucking cracker. I don't know it. Yeah. Right, so Border Dash is it's it's really good fun. So uh, you got a bunch of cards with really weird but genuine names of for things, mm. um, and basically one person will pull the card and they'll read it out. Um, and uh, as an example, I don't know Mumble Crumpet, and then everybody else has to write down what they think a Mumble Crumpet is, and then that person reads it out, and then every, the rest of the party has to basically decide which one's the real one and which one's made up, and it's mm. as easy as that. So, you, so as, as long as you can make up weird shit for funny names, you'll you have a laugh. That sounds fucking good, man. I like, I, I, I like party You'd games. You'd love it, Harrison. You yeah, I love totally it. would. I, I would. It's like fictionary, isn't it? We're, we're play, oh, that's but cool. we're, it's, that's where it come from, I think. Yeah, we we play uh, yeah. we play. But it's come out in nineteen eighty four. We will play it uh, this Christmas, maybe because you'll love it, mate. It's a really really funny game. Oh, actually, no, please, I actually, just remembered. Please. I just remember one that we fucking uh, that I played. And look, I know this isn't doing much for my nerd cred, right? Because I don't really like board games. But the um, <laughs> there's one that we played. We went. My my wife, she loves this fucking place um, in Croydon Board Game Cafe because it means you don't have to uh, buy yeah. the board games. You just go have a drink and play them, right? And we found this one called What Do You Meme? And obviously being, uh, being yeah. quite the meme lord, um, this yeah. was really, really good. So you put a picture down and if, it's kind of like Cards Against Humanity, but with meme humor, right? So I've played you put it, a yeah, picture down and it's one of the famous meme templates. And then you have to put like, you have to put like um, a card down and then somebody decides which one's the funniest. And it'd be like, say for example, you know that there's the one that's like fucking, there's a button with nut written on it and the hand <laughs> going towards it, right? <laughs> and it's like yeah. somebody put that and uh, it was fucking Ryan put down when your mum calls you. And it's like, it's like <gasps> stuff like this. Like oh. it does get a little bit gross and it is crude, a bit like Cards Against so it's Humanity. Like cards but Against I've, Humanity, but for memes. Yeah, yeah. And, but I kind of find that it, it was kind of inherently a bit slightly more funnier and i know i've talked yeah, about yeah, yeah. I, I don't think cards against humanity is real actually that funny but this one's no. uh, despite what i just said quite a bit less crude and it's it's pretty mm -hmm. funny um, but yeah that was a pretty good one i enjoyed the fuck nice. out of it mm. all right uh that is it for questions then Ooh. should we do an oh, outro no, there is another one i think it's worth worth asking i'll oh, go on uh it's from uh manoa o behave yep <laughs> 
said, what type of pumpkin is James? A nice well, one. Can you see why I didn't include that in the plan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, do, I didn't see that second. one. I just, I, I, I thought better of it. You just allowed it. You allowed it right up. Son. What happened to us asking every single question we ever got asked, eh? Yeah. Well, the, the <laughs> trouble is, James. That's what happens when you reach the top. Okay, we got too famous and we've sold out. <laughs> it used to be about the music, man. Yeah, man. All right, let's do an outro. Buddy. Hey, buddy, what you nibbling on? Snacks, buddy. Snacks, buddy. Nigga, what you eating on? Snacks, nibble. Snacks, nibble. Hey, nigga, what you eating on? Snacks, nibble. Snacks. So I just want to, uh, I just want to say, right, that you, you fucking listeners need to buck your ideas up, right? Because you've been getting this for free for five fucking years. Go to Patreon and donate and to the Three T RPG podcast. And if you do, if you do, you're allowed to continue listening. If not, delete yeah. the phone. Okay? <laughs> Delete. You're done. <laughs> You're done. Delete. You're done now. Delete. <laughs> um, I also wanted to just mention that we've got a Discord. I, I don't know how to get to Discord. I don't know if it works, but I think if you search for it, you can find it. Is that right, lads? Uh, yes, yes. Um, I will post invites to everything as well. Yeah, we do have it. We've had a Discord for years, actually, but Harrison only just realised. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving it. It's really great. It's like a it lot of the uh, a lot of the listeners are in there. We used to yeah. talk shit, and uh, last night yeah, was... they all talk shit to each other. Yeah, yeah. And I I just realised like after about three years that it's there. So <laughs> so now it's relevant. Uh, but it, yeah, last night I was playing some Caves of Cud, a road like game, and uh, was chatting to a couple of the listeners while they, I was streaming that. It was quite it was quite nice, fun. Nice, so yeah, go, get down there, and of course we've got products on Drive Through RPG. But that's uh, if you want to contact and us. You mentioned earlier. Oh yeah. Sorry. You've got to plug a plug. All right, yes. Uh, I did mention I was going to mention this mention, so get ready because here comes the mention. Um, mega, no. Amazing, no. Wait a minute. So, okay, right. Here's what he wants me to say. Here's the copy. This is Ace B. Pretend I'm Ace B right now. He says, Hertfordshire Board Games Club started as a local board games club and collection of friendly nerds. Since the COVID lockdowns, we have members from all of the UK and Europe. We do annual fundraising for Mind Mental Health Charity, and this year there are over 22... Uh, uh, there are over 2.5k pounds, including some cool guys called 3T RPG publishing worth of prizes to be spit split amongst raffle winners. Um, all raffle entrances and donations will go directly to Mind, and people can find details by entering at hartfordshireboardgamers.co.uk to or find on Facebook. So yes, go and do that because you can enter a raffle, win some cool prizes, including our products that we are gonna um, so hopefully figure out how to send this guy a code. And it's for Mind, <laughs> a mental health yes. charity, right? Very for good. men, I think. Yeah. And you know, the biggest killer of men over 21, uh, 21 and around 21, isn't ghosts. I thought it, oh, what? No, it's not ghosts, right? Oh. It's D and D. No. Rage quitting. No, no. no. <laughs> it's quite more, a lot more serious for that. So I think this is a lovely cause and a good yeah, thing. No, you're so absolutely right. If <clears throat> our so-called products can help, that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, isn't it? That is it, mate. That is it. I just don't want to let you two go. No. I feel the. <laughs> I just feel the crushing loneliness. That's why I've been streaming <laughs> recently. A, I want to jump on your stream this weekend. Yes, please do. Um, it would be really, really fun to have you along, and hopefully 100%. you can actually help, because yes, I've mate. been doing really badly. And I cannot wait for what's coming up next on that, which I don't want to give away in case you haven't told anyone yet. No, I have. I've mentioned it. What, doing okay. the Resi 2 remake. Yes, my favourite yeah, one. Yeah. It's going to be a nice. lot of fun. I'm so looking forward to that one, because it's one I'm, I'm actually sort of all right at. Yeah. Um, and uh, Resi 1 is so, so annoying. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, all right. Well, I have been Harrison Hunt. I've been Nick Lambslice. And I've been James Pumpkin. And just remember <laughs> that D20s are cool, but 20Ds, now that is a good time. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs>